Good morning, everybody. Uh, or for some of you, I guess it's a uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for joining our webinar today. This is a two day program uh, on infection prevention and control, controlling antimicrobial resistance transmission. So uh, it's obviously a very hot topic at the moment. And uh, this program has been put together and brought to you uh, by two of the um, of the networks, EBCTP networks, Pandora and Cantam, and also Alert. So in fact, that's three. And also with the Global Health Network. So we're working uh, in collaboration to bring this to you. So we've got a very packed programme for you today. Uh, we're going to have a mix of um, presentations and then we'll have some question and answer um, sessions for you to post your questions and uh, we'll have a, our panel to, to try and discuss those for you. So let's just go through um, just a few housekeepings um, and I think we're going to have a slide up for that in a moment. Uh, thank you very much, Bonnie. Um, just to remind you, uh, this is being recorded is going to be shared on the Global Health Network platform. So it will actually be on the Pandora uh, Knowledge Sharing Hub. And we're doing that because of course, uh, many colleagues aren't able to join us today. And then it means many more people can benefit uh, from this workshop. So just to remind you about that, um, you will actually see that uh, we've actually uh, disabled your audio and video. This is a, a webinar. so. Um, you, you aren't able to control that yourself, but you, if you use the question and answer box, you can see down at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A box with two little speech bubbles. And uh, you can use that to introduce yourself and then to post your comments. So you can send your comments uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to everyone and to the speakers. And we'll be facilitating your questions and then uh, we can unmute you uh, if needed to, to join in that discussion. And so we're doing that just to make sure that uh, we, we reduce the amount of, of noise during the webinar. Now, I'm sure everybody would like to receive a certificate of attendance for this. It's important um, for our training. You do need to have attended at least 80% of the webinar each day. So I uh, just wanted to make that clear. So that's both today and tomorrow. Also, there's going to be a workshop evaluation. And I'm afraid we, you've got to fill that in in order to receive your certificate. That's the way it works. So it's not very long. It won't take you long. And it, it, we do that so that that really is going to help us to improve our workshops. Global Health Network are, are, are facilitating a lot of different workshops with a lot of different networks. And it means we can bring you the best possible training. So you'll get your certificate emailed to you um, after you've met those requirements. It'll probably be within about a month of the workshop. So you, it'll be a nice um, early Christmas present for you. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this workshop is brought to you particularly by the Pand Pandora and Cantam networks. Uh, which are working in Central Africa and, and across Sub-Saharan Africa. And the coordinator of both of those networks is Professor Francine Toomey, uh, who's based in Brazzaville in the Republic of Congo. So we're just going to have a short uh, welcome presentation from Professor Ntumi. I'm afraid she's not here in person. This is a recorded presentation. And then I'm going to introduce you to our first chair for our first session. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, wherever you are. I'm Francine Toomey, the coordinator of the Central African Network on Clinical Research, Cantam, and also the coordinator of Pandora. Both are the uh, uh, network's partner for the organization of this important workshop. So I'm very happy to welcome health workers from low and middle income countries attending this workshop. But I'm sure that we have also in participants, many students and also many scientists interested in this important topic. So five 
sessions have been uh, will be conducted under this workshop and you will learn a lot and on which measure to use to prevent and also to control antimicrobial resistance at your institution. And at the end of this workshop, you will receive certificate. But that's not the end, because then you will be able uh, to identify, to understand where the gaps are at your institution and to address them. But of course, all the facilitators of this workshop will assist you if you need any kind of assistance for addressing these gaps. So to finish, I would like to thank all the participants for taking time to attend this important workshop. But also, I would like to deeply thank the facilitators who will do, I'm sure, very good presentations and I'm sure that we will continue all together to address the issue of antimicrobial resistance in our countries. So I wish you all the best for this workshop. Great, thank you, Francine. Um, so we're going to go straight into um, our first session, our introductory session. So I'd like to introduce the chair for this session uh, is John Tembo. Uh, John uh, is a postdoctoral research scientist. He's based at Herb Z in uh, Zambia. And uh, John is somebody that we, uh, we know very well. He's uh, a key collaborator in Cantam, in Pandora, in Tessa, uh, in many networks. So John, I'd like to hand over to you, please, to share, share this first session. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, so this first session will comprise two presentations, um, an introduction to IPC and an introduction to AMR. Um, They'll be given by Chiara Montaldo, um, which will be the introduction to IPC, and uh, Srinivas will give the will give the talk on the introduction to uh, AMR. Uh, Chiara Montaldo um, obtained her her degree in medicine and surgery uh, from the University of uh, Genoa in Italy in 1999. Um, in 2001, she got a diploma in tropical medicine from the Institute of Tropical Medicine, uh, Prince Leopold in Antwerp, Belgium. Um, since then, she's uh, worked on projects in the Republic of Congo, um, on clinical comparative uh, trial malaria, uh, anti-malarials. Um, she's also worked with um, uh, Medicine Sans Frontier um, as a medical doctor, project coordinator and a medical coordinator in the fields of HIV, uh, TB. Um, she's also worked on Chagas diseases in Latin American communities. Um, so um, she'll be giving the talk uh, on the IPCs. Srinivas, who's a postdoc uh, from the uh, University of Tübingen in Germany, um, will be giving us the introduction to AMR. Um, his main research interests include antimicrobial resistance, molecular diagnostics, um, surveillance, uh, and he also includes a One Health approach in this, and uh, host pathogen interactions and molecular diagnos diagnostics of infectious diseases. Um, so the first uh, presentation on introduction to IPC will be from 9.15 um, to 9.45. Then we'll go straight into the presentation uh, on introduction from AMR, which will go from 9.45 to 10.15. Uh, after that, we'll have a Q&A session from 10.15 to 11 hours, and then we'll have a coffee break. Um, so please uh, feel free during the presentations to type your questions into uh, the Q&A um, um, section. Of, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a Q&A tab. You can type in all your questions into that Q&A tab. Um, myself, uh, Mulemba Samutella, and Ken Awondo will be monitoring the questions. 
um, and we'll ask, we'll be directing the questions to the respective uh, presenters um, during the Q&A session. So uh, without further ado, um, I will hand over to Kiara for her presentation uh, on introduction to IPC. Kiara, over to you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, John, for the for the presentation. Uh, so I will share my screen first of all. Okay. So uh, yes, I'm going to introduce the the topics of um, of uh, IPC infection prevention and control. Um, during these two days, you are going to see uh, much more in detail uh, all the activities uh, related to IPC. But uh, here in the introduction today, I, I want uh, to uh, really um, give some basic concept on IPC. So what it is, why it is so important to implement it, and how we can implement it in our health structure. And then very few slides to make the link between IPC and uh, antimicrobial resistance, which is the, the real topic of the workshop, why these two are so linked. And, how IPC can really uh, decrease and improve the management of, of AMR. So we are going to see this today. So what is uh, infection prevention and control? It's actually a scientific approach. Uh, in, we want to implement a very pra practical solution. We will see some of them. And we will see sometimes there are even very easy solutions which are designed to prevent harm caused by infection to patients, to healthcare workers, and we will see even to others out of the health structure, the community, the family member, the visitors. It is grounded in principle of infectious diseases for sure, uh, epidemiology, but also on social science and health system strengthening. And, that's why it should always be adapted to the, con uh, to the content. So here I will present a general uh, uh, introduction, but then each one has to adapt it and to tailor on different contexts and situation. And then the main uh, aims are at the patient safety and the good health service quality. So who is at risk of infection? In a healthcare structure, of course, uh, patients are at risk of infection, but health workers also. And uh, uh, don't forget all the health people working in the hospital. We always focus very much on doctors and nurses, uh, for sure, to provide training, to provide uh, equipment, to provide knowledge. But don't forget there are other people working in the health structure, and they are very important in implementing the good IPC. And these people are, for example, the cleaners, uh, all the people entering, managing the waste, uh, touching the patient, uh, cleaning the environment. So all these people are also at risk of infection. But then the risk is not limited only to the health structure because all of us, we go out from the hospital and we go back to the community, to our family, to our friends. So whatever we got in the hospital, we might potentially bring it outside. So that's why I said at the beginning, the aim of a good IPC is to prevent infection in the patient, in the health worker, but then even further in the community. Uh, some infection are not hosted uh, only in the human being, but there are possibly other hosts. Uh, there are uh, for example, vector of diseases, you know very well. Uh, there are reservoir of diseases, so animals carrying the, the virus or bacteria. And there are also vehicle, which can be uh, in the chain of transmission. So the, there is really a chain of transmission from an infectious agent to the reservoir, uh, to the new host and so on. So it's, uh, it's very important to keep in mind that this is, is a chain and the aim of IPC is to break any one of these links because if we manage to break any of these links, we can actually stop the disease transmission. So as we say, so many people are at risk. So these same people who are at risk are also the potential uh, 
people benefiting from a good IPC implementation. So if we manage to implement good IPC, we protect ourselves as healthcare worker, we protect our patient and we protect our family and community. And this is really the main message that I want to give you today. So to implement some uh, often simple uh, procedure can really have a great benefit, not only inside the hospital, but also outside. So there are several components of IPC programs. Uh, normally, when, when we, we talk about uh, IPC, we immediately think about uh, personal control, the, the number three, let's say. We think about masks, we think about PPE, gloves, goggles, our protection, individual protection. But this is actually only one component of IPC. And uh, actually there are first, before the personal control, there are two very important components. The administrative control and environmental control. Let's see what, what they are about. So uh, the administrative control um, involve different activities uh, which are essential to implement a good IPC in a health structure. It is very important to define someone who is responsible for IPC, an infection control manager, I call it here. Uh, so someone who doesn't need to do everything, but he needs to manage everything, to coordinate all the uh, activity to be implemented in terms of infection control. Um, it's important that this manager um, ensure that there is an infection control plan and this plan is updated and adapted to the context. Uh, and it should normally be updated uh, quite often because the ecology of, uh, of the bacteria, of the resistance uh, change, we will see during the, this workshop. So uh, it should be in a live document. It should not be uh, some, something written and then forgotten. And uh, the, the, um, the team, the staff should be aware of the, con the infection control plan. It should not be something to put on the shelf, but really the, the staff should be trained uh, considering that there is always um, often a turnover of staff. So it's um, needed to do refreshing uh, training about IPC to make sure that these are continuously implemented. Uh, administrative control include also a good uh, triage system. Um, we will talk a bit uh, more in detail about triage. Uh, and uh, again, the uh, administrative control include also the, uh, the standard precaution implementation, which need to be implemented for all patients, plus additional precaution, which need to be put in place in some special situation, like it is now, for example, the COVID epidemic, Ebola epidemic, class of fever, TB. So, these, uh, these uh, are special situations uh, which require often additional precaution. But what is important is that the standard precaution actually need to be always put in place for all the patients independently from a special situation. So uh, I said that the triage is important. Why? Because the triage is normally the first contact that the patient has uh, with, with the health structure. So uh, a potential infectious patient arrived there and that is the very first moment that we can suspect an infection and we can take the precaution to try to reduce the possibility of transmission of this infection to other patient and to health worker. So it is very important to have uh, uh, staff well trained in IPC at the triage. Um, often I saw that in the triage, uh, the new staff is put there, but this is not a very good idea. Someone experienced in IPC should be at the triage because as I say, is, a, is the very first uh, contact of the patient with the, with the hospital. So it's, in, and, and the IPC, it's very important to be implemented at the very beginning. The time is a very important uh, component of the IPC to identify or to suspect an infection in time allowed us to, to take uh, some precaution. For example, to isolate the, the patient that we suspect to be, to be infectious. And uh, accordingly with the infection that we suspect, we will see which type of isolation. 
So the triage is really an essential moment in all the health structure, and we need really to put uh, uh, in place a good triage with the good equipment in the triage. Equipment, I, I mean all the uh, material that is needed to provide a, triage, a safe triage. So we will see uh, later what, what I mean. Uh, but as I say, um, standard precaution are a very important part of the IPC and this should be always implemented. Um, when we have uh, an epidemic like now, COVID, we are very aware of the IPC as uh, in other uh, outbreak in Ebola, in Lassa, so we are very aware and attentive. What is happening sometimes that we are less attentive when we are in, in the intra-epidemic period. So we tend to, to low a bit our attention, but this should never be done. This standard precaution that you are going to see in detail in the next presentation should always be put in place for all the patients. So end hygiene, number one, respiratory hygiene, a PPE, so a protective equipment according to the risk, safe injection practice and good sharp management uh, and the good cleaning disinfection of the patient, of the patient care equipment, of, of the room, of the environment uh, and uh, a, a proper waste management. So these are precautions which should be always taken in, in any health structure with any type of patient and in any type of situation. Uh, about hand hygiene, uh, we always uh, talk a lot because it's, uh, it's very simple and it's very, very important. And here I want to give you an example of uh, a doctor that I met in, in uh, Congo. Uh, this doctor was the, the one who saw the first patient in the Ebola outbreak in Ecuador province. Uh, before that the outbreak was declared. So he saw the very first patient before to know that they were Ebola patients. And uh, many of his staff actually got infected and they died because of Ebola, but he was uh, safe, fortunately. And he himself, he told me, I'm safe because I'm always used to wash hands uh, in between every patient uh, with uh, soap and water, with the chlor chlorine or with other disinfectant that we, you are going to see in the next presentation. So um, he, he was aware that uh, the simple hand hygiene, proper hand hygiene, save his life. And um, why I underline this uh, example? Because this was not uh, yet declared an Ebola outbreak, but it was uh, like a normal inter-epidemic period. And that's, and that's uh, uh, when we really need to keep our attention high. Respiratory hygiene is important. Of course, now with COVID, uh, we, we stress a lot the importance of respiratory hygiene, but this is um, something to be put in place all the time. And not only to do ourselves as a healthcare worker, but also to promote among our staff and among the patients. So uh, it's important always to make uh, patient aware of it, especially in, in a waiting areas, in the place where patients uh, uh, are together uh, and close one each other. So it's important to, um, to, to think about the poster or health promoter, providing these messages to, to the patient and any type of education which can implement the respiratory hygiene in the health structure. Um, the PPE. So the PPE, um, there are many kinds of PPE and I'm not going to in this detail in this presentation, but just to show you that of, on the, your right side, you will see the full PPE, what we call the full PPE is really the protection that we need for some special situation like Ebola, Lassa fever. Of course, most of the time we don't need this, but we, we still need a basic PPE that we should always wear with any kind of patient in any kind of situation in the health structure, which include the scrub, which include the gloves, the eye protection, and often even the surgical mask, not always, but in some places, for example, at the triage, it will be good. Safe injection practice, this is extremely important, especially for nurses and doctors and all uh, the, the staff uh, performing injection. 
Uh, so these are the basic rules. I'm not going through all of these, but uh, um, even if you're not directly the one doing the injection, uh, you should always make sure that someone, the IPC manager, is always um, sure that all these procedures are, are followed in a safe way and that the material is available. Sometimes it happened to me to, to go to structure and, and the staff uh, was very aware of the, the right procedure, but they told me we don't have the, the, the safe uh, disposable uh, box, for example. We ran out or it was too, um, too full and it was uh, even dangerous to try to put a needle in. So uh, it, should, um, it should be always um, kept in mind that it's important the staff training for sure, but it's also important to ensure that the staff has the proper equipment and material to, uh, to, to be able to, to actually follow the good practice. The environment cleaning. I said at the beginning that we all, uh, often for, forget uh, some of the staff working with us in the hospital. The cleaner, the people who are in charge of uh, cleaning, disinfecting, and sometimes sterilize the, the places, the patient, the room, the, the material used uh, for, for, for the patient care. So again, um, even if we are not the one doing directly this, we should make aware that the, the staff always know what they should do and when, so that they perform a, a proper routine cleaning and the proper terminal cleaning, when to do what, when to use the material, when, uh, when is necessary to perform each type of cleaning. Again, I'm not going in detail, but uh, be aware that a, a good IPC plan include also the cleaning, include a good schedule of cleaning, what should be used, when and how. And all the staff performing this should be always well training about it. And the same for waste management. Waste management in a health structure is extremely important and it's important to, to collect well the waste, to segregate, to transport properly to store when is needed and to know how to treat the different ways according with the different risk. So someone was, should always be in charge of the waste management to ensure that the waste are not a possible vehicle of infection themselves. And then, as I say, there are special situations in which we might put in place additional precaution. And of course, these are based on the mode of transmission. So there are, there are infections which are transmitted by direct modes or in indirect modes. Direct means a direct contact with the patient, so by touching, skin-skin contact, uh, uh, normally skin-skin in, in the hospital, but anyway, directly. Or even droplet is considered direct uh, modes. Why? Because you need to be really directly in contact with the patient. And then there are indirect modes, for example, airborne transmission. So I don't really need to be in contact with the patient, but if the patient stay in a room not ventilated and, uh, and then I enter after the patient was in, I might uh, uh, get the infection. Or other indirect modes are the one uh, transmitted by vehicles. So object which can be infected, like for example, the material touched by the, by the infected patient or vectors or animals as we saw. So uh, we should always uh, put in place uh, uh, measures that prevent this type of transmission based on what we suspect. Most of the time in, uh, in a hospital, we should be aware of the uh, direct modes, um, but also consider the indirect modes. Um, regarding the contact precaution, if we suspect that uh, an infection is transmitted by direct contact, uh, for example, here in, in Europe, uh, we have a lot of infection in the hospital, for example, Klebsiella, Clostridium, and many uh, multidrug resistant bacteria, which, is, which are uh, transmitted by contact precaution. And the vehicle, most of the time, are the hands of the healthcare worker, actually our hands. So it's important to keep in mind that these infections are frequent in the, in the health structure. So 
when is needed and when it's possible, we should try to isolate possible uh, infected or confirmed infected patient. When it's not possible, at least we should put in place the contact precaution. So always to wear gloves, hand hygiene, as I say, avoiding uh, touching eyes, nose or other mucosa. Wear an appropriate PPE when it's possible, uh, one use PPE um, and uh, appropriate equipment cleaning. Uh, this is really in, in Europe, but uh, more and more, I guess, even in African countries, is becoming a huge problem. The, the nosocomial infection, the nosocomial transmission of infection by contact uh, with an infected patient. It's really uh, growing the, the problem of, uh, of outbreak, real outbreak of, uh, as I say, Klebsiella, Clostridium, we are seeing a lot. And in a way, the COVID uh, epidemics, in a way, it's helping us to implement some of the precautions that actually we should always implement, non, not only because of the COVID, but also for other type of infection. Then uh, there are um, infection transmitted by droplet. Uh, droplet are this big and are big enough to precipitate, so they don't remain in the hair. That's why they are a bit less dangerous, let's say, in terms of transmission of the airborne uh, transmitted disease because they don't remain in the, in the hair, but uh, still are a possible uh, cause of transmission. So even for, for those, if we suspect an infection uh, transmitted by droplet, if it's possible, we should always isolate a, a patient. We should uh, use the appropriate um, PPE for respiratory protection, so mask, eye protection, gown, and we should limit the movement of the patient uh, until we think that the patient is still contagious. Then there are infections transmitted uh, by airborne. So uh, even for, for those, we should uh, um, isolate the patient when it's possible to take all the precaution in terms of respiratory uh, uh, precaution. And we should ensure a good ventilation of the spaces uh, where the patient is. Uh, so. So all of these were part of the, the first uh, component of the IPC. So what I have called the administrative controls. And uh, I just want to uh, underline that it's important to have someone responsible of it who make always uh, aware that all these uh, procedures are well followed. The second are the environmental control. So these are uh, the, these have the objective to reduce and limit the, the exposure to infection of staff, visitor, and uh, patient who are not yet infected. And there are many um, ways to control this. It depends, of course, which infection we are suspecting or we are dealing with. Here I present some sample. I will show you some picture of project where I have worked. Um, this first picture are mainly about TB clinic. This is a clinic in South Africa, it's a TB clinic. And I wanted to show that it was built uh, in a way to have window in every uh, room and the window should always be open. Um, this is possible, of course, where the, the, the weather allowed this. Otherwise, we should think about other way of ventilation. This is the same uh, clinic. As you can see, uh, some of the walls were completely made a window, really with the intention to ensure a good ventilation. This was the waiting area of the general hospital. And I don't know if it's possible to see from the picture, but okay, there is a shelter, but the, the wall are free. I mean, the, it's, a, it's an open space actually. And this again is to ensure a good ventilation, especially in the waiting area which are really a high risk place because of course you have a mix of, of patients and we don't know who might be infective and contagion or who not. So these are very um, special places, the waking area, and there are places where we should always implement um, health promotion with people talking with person, but also we put in poster and it's a good uh, time and place uh, to make the patient aware of the risk of, of uh, possible infection and the, post and the precaution that they can take to decrease this risk. 
uh, this is the same thing, just to show you the, the number of windows that we try to put everywhere, especially in the waiting areas. Uh, these are pictures taken in Mumbai TB clinic in India. And um, here we, we had a structure with less window, but uh, we managed to, to put fan and exhaust fan to, um, to be able to direct the flow. And uh, sometimes also to think about the simple things which can reduce the, the risk of the transmission. For example, to um, have air flow, even with the help of fan and exhaust fan, which avoid the, the air go to, from the patient to the health worker, but uh, uh, better the other way around. So putting the fan, for example, behind the health worker in the way that the airflow is directed on, on the, the side, uh, on the other side. So it is not coming to the health worker, but it's, it's going uh, out. Um, and uh, as part of the environmental control, there is also the setup of our structure. Um, here I put an example of um, Ebola treatment center in which we have built low risk area and high risk area. And in which it was clear to everybody that the staff has to follow uh, always a pathway from the lower risk area to the higher risk. And it could not go back. So uh, it's always important, not only to have a good structure, but also to have um, some uh, clear uh, uh, instruction how the staff should work and move inside the, the areas. This, of course, in an Ebola case like this is essential, but normally should be always the, the, the case to always consider to go from the lower risk patient to the higher risk. And when we have finished, before to go back to the low risk patient, we should wash our hand, change our PP if we have. So never go back from the high risk to the low risk. Um, in our setup, we should always consider uh, the, the, the visitors. So many times uh, um, we tend to, to forget this. But it's important, we are seeing now in, in COVID uh, care, how it's uh, terrible for the, for the relative, for the family member to uh, let the, the patient in without the possibility to see him, to talk with him, to see how it is. But actually there are possibilities feasible to allow visitor and family member to, to still be close to the, the patient, to the, the relatives, but close, but safe. And we can, we can do it. We have done it in Ebola, in Lhasa, and we can do it for any, any other infection. But of course, taking the, the proper precaution. So for example, here was an Ebola center. So uh, we uh, ensure a proper distance in between the visitors and the patient, but they could still see inside and talk with the patient, even with the high risk patient, let's say. And the third one is the personal control. This, I think uh, you all know, there are many, many items that we can use for personal control. You will go through all of this in these two days. So I'm not going in detail. And each, each um, item should be where thinking about uh, uh, which infection we are suspecting. Of course, we don't need all the item for every disease, but, uh, um, but we should have, uh, as I say, some standard precautions and some standard personal equipment that we always have. And then adding additional one when we suspect uh, different uh, infection. Now, uh, the, the last three slides of my presentation are um, just to make a link uh, between IPC and antimicrobial resistance. Uh, so why in a, in a workshop about uh, antimicrobial resistance, we started with IPC? Because there is a strict link in between the two. And actually a strong and good IPC implementation is, is the, the most effective approach to control the spread of antimicrobial resistance. And is the most cost saving. 
so um, in the in the healthcare facilities, uh, it is uh, proven that is actually really the most effective intervention that we can implement to to have safer hospital to reduce the number of infection and to spare antibiotics in order to um, avoid side effect, avoid the creation of resistance. An effective uh, infection prevention control saved lives and saved money. And these are some data from Europe, which can be a good example to motivate people to, to implement a good uh, IPC. So when uh, a good IPC and especially hand hygiene, which is a very simple uh, procedure are implemented well in combination with the antibiotic stewardship program, uh, it has been seen a reduction of two thirds of uh, frequency in antimicrobial resistance infection with uh, um, uh, 27,000 deaths avoid in Europe in one year, 85% reduction in health burden saving three euro per capita per person each year, which is uh, huge at the end. So it's really a, a very effective way to, say, to reduce uh, morbidity, mortality, and, and also to save money. And uh, in spite of this, globally, just uh, around a quarter of the countries has a dedicated budget for IPC at the national level. So this is really uh, a waste, is a, and, and it's a pity because we really uh, could save a lot of, uh, as I say, lives and money with, uh, with a good uh, implementation. Um, so without an effective IPC, it is impossible to achieve a good quality healthcare delivery, and uh, our capacity to respond to outbreak is really very much compromised. So my take home message is really this, that uh, IPC um, in, include quite simple and normally quite cheap activity, which can have a huge impact in terms of mortality, morbidity, and uh, in terms of uh, expenses. And uh, is uh, really the number one intervention that we can implement to reduce AMR in our uh, facilities and so in the community. I think was the last one. So I thank you all and um, I, I, I stop sharing. Uh, I'm available of course for the, for the question for in the Q&A session. Uh, thank you so much Chiara for that presentation on uh, uh, the introduction to IPC. Um, we will move straight into the introduction to uh, AMR. Uh, the presentation will be given to us by Srinivas Palela um, from the University of Tubingen. Um, just to remind everyone, you can type your questions into the Q&A chat bubble. Uh, at, it, it's just at the bottom of your screen. If you're using uh, a laptop, uh, if you're, if you're uh, joining us by an Android device or uh, iPhone, uh, it should be in the top right corner um, of your screen. Um, so you can ask us questions um, uh, during the presentations, which will then be presented at 10.15. Uh, so on to you, uh, Srinivas, uh, for the presentation on introduction to AMR. Hi, good morning. So can you hear me? Uh, just yep. a second. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, so good morning, uh, everyone. And uh, I thank you for giving me this opportunity for all the coordinators as well as the, the Pandora, Cantum and Alert team. And uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, antimicrobial resistance, uh, spread, diagnosis, and one health. And uh, so I wanted to just start with a message that uh, the more we use antibiotics, so the more we lose them. And uh, yeah, just a second. Yeah, so here is my outline of the talk. So of course, it's slightly different from what is uh, given to you all, but the message is same. 
So first, uh, I would be introducing about uh, about what is antimicrobial resistance. Then uh, I will be talking about uh, the common uh, antibiotic resistance pathogens. Then uh, I will be talking about uh, the spread, how AMR spreads. Then I will be talking about few examples of uh, uh, outbreaks. And then uh, I will be ending the talk uh, uh, with the diagnosis of the AMR. Okay, so first uh, I would like to start with uh, what is AMR. So we all know like it's not a new term, but just I would like to uh, like uh, brush up your uh, <clears throat> memory so that, uh, yeah, so AMR is the resistance of uh, bacterial, viral, parasitic and fungal microorganisms to uh, antimicrobial medicines that were previously effective treatment of infections. As we all know that uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance is not uh, new, uh, it, it occurs naturally, but uh, yeah, the, the resistance accelerate when uh, antibiotics are overused or uh, misused or counterfeit drugs, uh, counterfeit medicines are used. And uh, yeah, they are used uh, like when there is uh, no need. For example, when uh, people uh, usually take uh, antibiotics when there is viral infections, which is... Uh, uh, not a right thing to do. So these are all uh, usually accelerate the development of antimicrobial resistance. So usually, yeah, we see that uh, hospitals and long-term care, uh, care facilities are uh, hotbeds uh, for the antimicrobial resistance. And also now we also see that uh, spreading through to the communities. Yeah, of course, uh, these uh, organisms can be resistant to more than one drug. Uh, like uh, then uh, they are called uh, multi-drug uh, uh, resistance organisms. Yeah, so uh, AMR is a global threat and uh, usually annually about, uh, it leads to 700,000 uh, deaths. And uh, if uh, this is not controlled efficiently, then it might lead to around uh, 10 million deaths by 2050. Yeah, so it has a severe implications in the healthcare expenditure and it leads to prolonged stays in the hospitals and uh, it increases the mortality and mobility. So yeah, it causes also implications in the global health, it causes poverty, it might lead to yeah, effects in the economic growth and it impacts uh, each and everyone. So, and uh, we have seen that uh, antibiotics are uh, not exclusively used to, for uh, treating uh, infections in the human beings, but they are, are used to around 70% of the antibiotics are used as a growth promoters and uh, as a prophylaxis so to, like, uh, to, uh, to gain uh, weight of the animals as well as uh, yeah, to prevent the diseases in the animals. Yeah, we have seen the another problem that we have currently is that no pharma company is investing on the developing new drugs this is because the development of antibiotics uh, is uh, not any more profitable. And uh, yeah, even uh, if they develop also the antibiotic uh, stays for a very short period of time in the market because of uh, the resistance. So there is a need to, to develop uh, new antibiotics. Even though new antibiotics comes continuously, so there is also need for the preventive because uh, uh, as soon as a uh, new antibiotic comes into the market, it goes, uh, it comes, be it becomes resistance very quickly. So both the development of uh, new drugs as well as uh, preventive measures uh, for AMR is necessary to efficiently use this uh, to to efficiently use the antibiotics. And uh, here is the graph uh, that shows the use of antibiotics by around uh, 20 countries, uh, 20 devil industrialized countries. And we see, uh, and uh, yeah, so this uh, graph basically shows that uh, the number of uh, doses per thousand people taken per day and uh, the development of uh, penicillin resistance uh, of streptococcus pneumonia. If you can see this graph, we, we see that there is a direct correlation of the antibiotic use uh, to that of uh, the development of resistance. And if you see at the bottom, we see two countries, Netherlands and Denmark. 
So Netherlands and Denmark have taken a very good uh, stewardship measures to effectively control uh, antibiotic uh, antibiotic usage, and we can see that uh, they are at the bottom of the gap. They have they have less usage as well as they have uh, de they have lower development of the resistant. Yeah, like uh, if we lower uh, the usage of the antibiotics. still we can go back uh, and increase the sensitivity of course we don't increase but usually we can again uh, reuse if you see one example hydroxychloroquine so there has been uh, resistance uh, for this drug long back uh, for malaria but uh, yeah recent studies shows that uh, the i mean again most of the malaria uh, most of the, uh, the parasites are now in uh, sensitive so they are also planning to reintroduce this hydroxychloroquine for treating uh, malaria so this is a very good example like when we like stop treating then the sensitivity increases then we can reintroduce the drug into the clinics yeah and uh, yeah so how this antibiotics are emer resistant to much see and in the in the normal environment either in the human uh, gut or in the environment or in the animal gut so we have like uh, different population of bacteria but they are they differ uh, slightly so when uh, antibiotics are given at the low doses and they are not taken sufficiently or they are they are used as a growth promoter at lower concentrations so what we can see is that uh, some of the some of the bacteria they have capability uh, they have a, they might be they are resistant and uh, all the sensitive bacteria that are shown a hello uh, they will be like they will be like dying and then only the resistant bacteria that populates uh, uh, in the uh, in the environment or in the humans as well as in the human yeah, animals and then this uh, the resistant bacteria colonizes and then it might lead to spread to yeah communities or between the population or between animals and humans and uh, yeah next, so if you see here this is how the common mechanism of air amr takes place so this cartoon shows about the structure of the bacteria and uh, yeah this is the structure of the bacteria we can see here and uh, the bacteria uh, the uh, the antibiotics can be resistant by through different mechanisms either the antibiotics are prevented from entering the cells or uh, the the concentrations will decrease or uh, there are pumps that uh, that pump out the antibiotics uh, or they due to small mutations uh, so in the gene so this will change the structure of a protein so that it will not allow the antibiotic to bind efficiently to the receptor or uh, yeah as soon as the antibiotic enters the some of the enzymes might cleave for example uh, yeah uh, carbapenemases or penicillinases uh, these enzymes like uh, uh, cleave the uh, antibiotic as soon as it enters so this all makes the antibiotics resistance and uh, yeah if you see through various mechanisms this uh, will be developing uh, the resistance sometimes mainly the development of resistant is through gaining the genetic material from the uh, uh, from the environment or like for example small plasmid that uh, has the resistant gene can are usually shared uh, between the bacteria so in this way then the bacteria develops resistance and uh, yeah the propagates and then survives in that environment and then uh, colonizes and uh, if you see this is also one small example of uh, the mechanism of carbapenemase uh, uh, carbapenemase in enterobacteriaceae so carbapenemase is a very like uh, the priority uh, yeah priority uh, for uh, the enterobacteriaceae carbapenemase resistant enterobacteriaceae is a priority gene uh, a priority for the resistance that was selected by the who and if you see the various mechanisms by which uh, this carbapenemase resistance can occur either so this is a cartoon shows uh, the the anti uh, the either the antibiotic is prevented from entering the cell even if the if the antibiotic enters the antibiotics are broken down by the resistant genes that are carbapenemases or they are efflexed uh, uh, out quickly so that uh, the the bacteria survives 
and this is also another uh, mechanism uh, i'm showing you an example showing that mechanisms of extensively drug resistant so these bacteria can be resistant for more than one uh, uh, one drug so you can see like uh, this is a multi drug resistance so this bacteria shows the resistance for almost all the antibiotics that are used currently used in the market so they decrease the expression of the uh, pro uh, the the porins that the antibiotics enters or uh, they cleave the antibiotic like i said earlier they break down the antibiotics or uh, they they prevent the binding by changing the, the mutation so and also yeah then yeah like uh, yeah almost uh, all the antibiotics develop uh, resistant through different mechanisms and also we know that uh, colocin is the last drug that is used to, for the treatment of infections if in case of all the drugs fails but recently we have seen also the resistance of the colocin has been developing and uh, yeah so here are uh, some of the multi drug resistance organisms uh, just to for the information so we see like uh, mrsa uh, methicillin uh, resistant staph aureus vancomycin resistant uh, enterococci pseudomonas aerogenes and uh, yeah the the uh, acetobacter baumani enterobacteriaceae and tuberculosis as everyone so these are some of the common multi drug uh, uh, resistance organisms uh, that are there and uh, yeah if you see this is the list that i like selected from the who uh, uh, prioritization list and uh, we see that mrsa and uh, this is chart shows that uh, different bacteria and their resistance and their proportion in uh, different continents uh, based on the who regions so i just i'm giving you one example for example staph uh, methicillin staph uh, resistant staph aureus in africa this is afr uh, we see like it varies highly from 12% to 80% and uh, yeah western pacific region it varies from uh, 4 to 8 per 84% so what i meant to say is that uh, so the resistances might vary between the countries or between the regions so uh, localized approaches are needed to identify which are the common resistance bacteria present and based on that appropriate measures need to be taken and also need to identify the source and in this way uh, it will help enable in uh, 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 actively prevent the anti development of active uh, resistance and uh, here is the list everybody knows this is the uh, who's pathogen priority list which has been uh, selected uh, based on uh, various uh, factors based on the uh, pathogenicity based on the uh, uh, prevalence and uh, uh, transmittability and uh, treatment as well as the drugs available so these are basically even though the only 12 uh, the bacteria are mentioned over here but it also adds another uh, one that is a tb which is everybody knows so this is why they have not added so it's like 13 uh, that they have put so these are like uh, basically selected for their uh, for the uh, research and development as well as the drug development priority and uh, yeah so next coming to the next part of the amr it is uh, how so amr spreads basically yeah we see like uh, antibiotics are uh, used to, in the animals as a growth promoters or for preventive measures or uh, they are used to, in the hospitals as we all know and uh, they are also used to, to treat the animals they are used in the fisheries industries so what will happen so there is a pause so the more the antibiotics are used uh, in this different uh, 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 in the animals hospital so this leads to the development of uh, antibiotic resistance individually and once it is developed so there is a possibility to spread between the animals and human usually like farmers will get in contact with the animals or the meat uh, that is produced from the animals like enter into the market and then this is consumed by the human beings uh, that might be having uh, carrying the resistant bacteria or the hospitals or the hot beds for the for the spread usually like uh, the icus and uh, these are the places 
so and also the people coming in contact with the uh, pet animals also like they might be carrying the resistant bacteria so this uh, and also these days we cannot uh, stop the antibiotic resistant at the borders so people travel and uh, the antibiotic sp uh, resistant spreads uh, globally so it's a global problem it's not uh, uh, a local problem so both localized as well as uh, globalized approaches are needed to efficiently tackle the amr and uh, here is the, some of the uh, list shows that the commonly present bacteria that are present in the fruit producing animals uh, as well as community as well as hospitals so we see that some of the bacteria are highly prevalent in almost to uh, in animals community and hospitals some are exclusively uh, present in the hospitals it doesn't mean that they are exclusively but there is a probability of finding high in this particular setting so because of uh, the host or the pathogen uh, pathogen and uh, yeah so we so this is how the uh, the once they are present they, they, this leads to spread of uh, amr and this is how uh, like uh, as we have seen like kaira has presented how if hygiene measures are not taken properly then the the amr can spread so for example if uh, this is the room a uh, hospital room shows uh, the patient bed as well as the surroundings all the icu uh, shows that and uh, this green marking shows that uh, the sample has been taken and then they have uh, tested it so that and what they found is that all the marked regions you see over here has been contaminated with the with the resistant bacteria so if we see like once these uh, bacteria amr bacteria are present in these surfaces then uh, yeah it will, if uh, the cleaning is not done properly or proper uh, yeah, care is not taken while handling the patient or the samples or specimens then it will lead to contaminate uh, all the equipment as well as the bed and then uh, even though we wear gloves if we touch these surfaces and then if we touch the other places then this is how uh, the antibiotic resistance will uh, spreads in the hospital and uh, yeah once it is spreads in the hospital it is very very difficult because uh, uh, yeah there will be a lot of antibiotic resistant bacteria and then this will lead to yeah development of multi drug resistant organisms and it takes uh, yeah so people even healthy people who might uh, ad, uh, get admitted in the hospital might get in contact and then lead to uh, morbidity and mortality mortality and uh, yeah so we also see the yeah as spread leads to also development of the outbreaks and here are a few examples of the outbreaks that i have taken uh, from uh, edcp website edcc e ecdc website and we can see these are the four examples i picked uh, there are uh, outbreaks uh, the outbreak of carbaminous carbapenem producing uh, uh, enterobacteriaceae in luthiana uh, luthiania and uh, outbreak of carbapenem producing uh, resistance and cholestin resistant in klebsiella pneumonia in germany and uh, yeah the other uh, yeah outbreaks so basically what is an outbreak so uh, outbreak is uh, nothing but like unusual number of cases we see for a particular organism so then we call it as an outbreak because uh, yeah here is an example i am showing you uh, the outbreak of uh, uh, carbapenem is uh, producing enterobacteriaceae in luthiania so this is what uh, this graph basically shows that uh on the x axis it shows the weeks and on the y axis it, it shows the number of cases so over the time if you see during the weeks we see a lot of cases and uh, these boxes uh, represent uh, the cases from various hospital here it shows that uh, around seven hospitals but uh, we see all the cases are from single hospital so this shows that uh, there is an outbreak in that particular hospital of these carbapenem uh, uh, resistant bacteria uh, enterobacteria so still when these uh, data has been taken still the outbreak has been going on so it is very very important to identify the source of the outbreak 
and take appropriate measures uh, to find out the cause as well and take uh, yeah uh, take appropriate action to prevent the spread of the amr and uh, coming to the final talk so diagnosis so for effectively prevent and uh, treat uh, or like surveillance so uh, uh, diagnosis is a plays a very important role so without diagnosis so nothing can be done in the amr so nothing we can say because uh, uh, we uh, anything uh, the decision that are taken to prevent or treat, treat it all depends on the data that comes from the diagnosis or from the surveillance and uh, i would say that uh, there are several uh, two uh, methods or the tools or diagnostic methods that are uh, available for the for the for diagnosing uh, the antimicrobial resistance so here if you see in this uh, yeah busy slides yeah, that i have taken from a review article so that shows that there are some uh, uh, techniques that are presently used there are some future and there are some so i won't be talking about future and emerging technologies that are uh, that are uh, currently being developed for diagnosis of the, the uh, developing the the, uh, the diagnostics that are developed for uh, uh, recognizing the amr basically to, uh, now i am going to briefly talk about the three techniques that are available so basically i will be talking about the common techniques that are used uh and uh, then uh, the, the phenotypic methodologies then i will be talking about the spectrometric spectrophoto spectrophotometric techniques and as well as the molecular techniques that are used for detection of amr and uh, here is uh, yeah the current technologies the current methods that are used to, for diagnosis and uh, in uh, the diagnosis identification and uh, yeah identification of organism and detection of the susceptibility to particular antibiotic is very very important so the gold standard for measuring the antibiotic resistance is uh, mainly the diffusion techniques and the dilution techniques and uh, if we coming to the diffusion techniques so kier by bauer method is the most common method that is used where uh, the antibiotic uh, the the discs with antibiotics are placed uh, in the the uh, the selected organism that and uh, yeah based on, and then the uh, it is kept overnight and based on the growth we can see like here the several discs uh, in this plate and they are from different antibiotics this is from penicillin oxacillin uh, tetracycline erythromycin and phoxacillin so we can see the we can see there is a zone of inhibition of the bacteria for almost all these antibiotics ex except for penicillin so this shows that uh, this particular organism is uh, resistant to penicillin but it is sensitive to for all the other organisms and also yeah diffusion technique uh, this disc diffusion methodology cannot give accurately what is the minimum uh, inhibitory con concentration that can be used to uh can, that can be uh, necessary for the inhibition of the bacterial growth so that is why yeah e tests are used so e, e tests are nothing but the, they are advanced uh, met, the diffusion uh, uh, disc diffusion uh, uh, method but uh, here uh, uh, antibiotic strips are used having different concentrations if you see on the right so this is an antibiotic strip having the different concentration and if these uh, strips are placed on the bacterial uh, plates then uh, the zone of inhib uh, inhibition we can see in the gradient so if you see here we can see the gradient uh, this is the lowest antibiotic and this is the highest antibiotic and we can see uh, uh, the based on this we can see uh, at the concentration at which the microorganism is inhibited so this will estimate the the amount of the drug can be used for the treatment and how sensitivity and how sensitivity is and this is also another technique that is commonly used uh, this is the plate method where the bacteria different uh, bacteria uh, bac uh, bacterial cultures are used and uh, different concentrations of uh, different antibiotics are used so from a lowest to highest concentration and the different antibiotics can be used and then uh, after overnight growth 
based on the turbidity uh, we can recognize uh, how much how whether the which bacteria is sensitive and then what is the concentration at which the bacteria is inhibited so based on this we can uh, check the susceptibility and the concentrations that are needed for the for the inhibition of the this will help the the doctor to exactly evaluate uh, i mean how much dosage of antibiotic can be given to the patients and uh, coming to the final slide uh, not final but the, the final method so this is a mild tough uh, uh, method that is also used currently uh, for the detection as well as identification i don't want to go but this is all just wanted to mention that this is also very uh, they also say that this is also very cheap uh, method to for the detection but uh, and uh, finally coming to the molecular methods is a very very important method and these are very sensitive and uh, this can be done quickly but needs a uh, lot of infrastructure and then the trained person and uh, yeah so in future uh, yeah so how quickly we diagnose uh, the uh, the microorganism as well as the resistance is very important um, and uh, this molecular methods uh, will enable to quickly diagnose so there are several uh, uh, several uh, kits that are currently available for this molecular detection but uh, but they are very very expensive so it is important to, to uh, customly develop some diagnosis so that it can be develop uh, it can be optimized for the particular labs and uh, sometimes uh, even though the ready made kits are available Uh, with the twenty panels or thirty panels, all might not be present. Uh, might not be appropriate to to use in that particular setting. It might be very expensive. It is important to recognize which are the common antibiotic resistance that is circulating. Based on that, it is good to develop some uh, localized uh, uh, technology. So in that way, like it will save uh, some money uh, in the poor countries, especially. or in the developing countries so there are uh, other techniques hybridization techniques later flow techniques and then the sequencing techniques that are available so i don't want to go into detail because of the time limit uh, yeah uh, so there is lot of information on youtube and uh, please uh, have a look and then you will uh, this this is an information age i'm just giving sometimes some leads so so that you can have a look uh, on internet and then can find uh, enough information about this and finally i would like to end uh, my talk with uh, uh, the one health approach uh, is needed to tackle amr so what is one health approach uh so there is a uh, what i would say is that uh, there is a need for collaborative effort uh, between various disciplines locally nationally as well as globally to optimally uh, 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 prevent this antimicrobial resistance for example there is a need for to work for the veterinarians as well as the medical doctors as well as public health officials as well as the environment people so everybody should work together to efficiently tackle the amr so this is what basically a, a one health is so without one health it is difficult to tag, uh, prevent because we just if you just treat the patients in hospital if you don't know the source from where it is coming how it is coming uh, so we keep on treating the patients uh, but uh, we will not, i mean yeah so the patients uh, the hospitals will be full but we don't know how to tackle it so it's a very important to use one health approach in future to uh, to prevent amr and uh, so thank you all and uh, this is one slide i am showing the this is a newspaper that uh, from my mother tongue so uh, from india and uh, yeah so this covers this is an yesterday's news clipping and uh, uh it shows uh, it like it brings awareness in the local population about the antibiotics usage and uh, how it can uh, how resistant can impact everyone so so this is what just i wanted to share uh, from my side yeah so the i would uh, yeah this is where i would like to end my talk and i thank you all for giving me this opportunity thank you so much uh sunevas for that presentation um giving us a brief uh, introduction to amr um we have uh we're going to proceed on to our Q&A session so mm -hmm. if you have any more questions you can type them in the Q&A box um and we will read the questions um 
uh, and ask the um, the appropriate uh, presenters to respond. Um, we have a question for you, uh, Srinivas. Yeah, let um, see. From yeah. Henry Hansen. Uh -huh. um, it says, can we really define AMR as per your introduction? Uh, and the WHO priority list uh, has viral parasites and fungal inclusive. Uh, I think the, the, the question is, um, shouldn't the de definition of ANR be inclusive of more than just uh, bacterial infections, I think, uh, from Henry Hansen? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, basically, yeah, we, I mean, it's too broad to talk over here regarding all the organisms. So uh, I have no idea whether they have also made a priority list for viral parasites and fungal. Uh, at this point, of, but bacteria is the major, uh, uh, antibiotics are the major uh, use. So this is why WHO might have made the priority list only for the antibiotics than uh, uh, viruses, parasites, and uh, fungal uh, fungal organisms. So this is what I would say. I don't know okay. how I answered my answered the question. <laughs> um, I think that um, we we'll move on to the next uh, question mm -hmm. um, from uh, Guy Onnet. Um, he said, he asks, is there any exposition time point when a bacteria becomes uh, resistant to any antibiotics? Yeah, I mean, there is no particular time point. It all depends on the usage. So the more that we use and uh, if they are not, you, uh, if the doses are not appropriately used, if the antibiotics is used to, for the growth promoters or without prescription, uh, like there is no time limit as such, but uh, it all depends on how often, how frequently, uh, and uh, if it is used unnecessarily, the antibiotic might become resistant within one year. So it all depends on the usage and it depends on the, uh, the stewardship mechanisms or the government uh, measures that it takes. Like, uh, for example, the antibiotic should not be given at the counter. So... Yeah, if it is given at the counter, then uh, within six months, the antibiotic resistance may, might come. It all depends on the usage. So there cannot be any definite uh, time point uh, for which the antibiotic can be, antibiotic resistance can be developed. So, but for every antibiotic, there will be resistance within the short period of time. Uh, because again, uh, the developing countries, these days, uh, the, uh, uh, they might use uh, the, the usage of antibiotics still might go up. So this will still, there is a possibility to accelerate the growth of uh, the AMR resistant in future, not decelerate. So efficient measures are need to be taken now. I would say that, yep. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so there's another question again from Guy on it. Um, most AMR is, is observed in Africa, but there are less resources in terms of capacity building and training to fight AMR. Um, what could be the way to challenge AMR uh, properly and effectively in low resource settings? Uh, what I would say is that, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Cantum, Pandora are already taking, uh, yeah, so it all starts with the surveillance. I mean, we, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the Pandora has already started a surveillance. First of all, we should know like a exa exact figure. So without knowing exact figures, it is difficult to tackle. So once we know the exact figure, it's good to go and then see uh, and also develop some localized approaches for diagnosis, how to, and also establish some labs, uh, build some capacity uh, at a local level and uh, talk with the, the officials or the ministries or uh, uh, spend more money to like screen. And yeah, these are the message. Uh, these are the message. I mean, the, there should be some active participation of the international organization as well as the local government to put some money and to develop the infrastructure and to train people. So this is where I think uh, there is a need to, and also, yeah, the, in the market, whatever that we purchase, the kits are very expensive. Uh, so it's also good to develop local, uh, some, uh, some local, uh, some 
uh, some uh, methodologies that can be used locally and specifically for sp specific organisms that are uh, highly resistant. So in this way, the cost of diagnosis will reduce and uh, yeah, the resources can be used much efficiently. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there is another question here from Ishmael Conte. Mm -hmm. um, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Reddy. In Africa, there is low, there's very low level knowledge of AMR among healthcare workers, especially lab technicians. Yeah. What recommendations or suggestions can you suggest to increase the knowledge of AMR in these groups? Uh, I think uh, there should be some uh, training uh, should be given to the technicians as well as healthcare workers, like for example, Cantum or this kind of, uh, I mean, uh, Pandora organizations or the uh, need to take a lead and then uh, assess the level of knowledge or, and then uh, some workshop needs to be conducted like we are doing right now. I mean, it would be, it would be like to do uh, the country level or uh, uh, yeah, it should start with from a, um, um, from a, from a lab that is uh, authorized and also from a, in a medical uh, colleges or the institutions uh, where we have doctors. So there the, some training can be given. And then this is how once like training can be given, then uh, automatically, yeah. So uh, healthcare workers or technicians will be aware and then appropriate measures are taken subsequently. I think training, uh, uh, sessions or workshops are needed to uh, needed. I would say that. Um, we have another question um, um, from R. Wengslus. Um, I direct this to the entire panel, Ken uh, Samuleta and and yourself, uh, Srinivas. Um, yeah. What do you think of uh, AMR bacteria such as mycoplasmas in dysbiosis or uh, bacterial vaginosis should we always treat? Mm, I have no answer for this. I'm not familiar. So if somebody in the panel can answer that, I would. it would be great. Anyone on the panel with a response to that question? Samuleta? Well, I, I can uh, I can answer, try to give an answer. It's not easy, but in general, uh, when we have uh, resistant bacteria, like in this case, but not only, uh, so we have two choices: like to try to to find uh, other antibiotics to, to which the bacteria might respond, or sometimes if we don't have. Uh, we can decide, that especially it depends also on the severity of the infection, we can decide to do a kind of washout. So to leave the patient without uh, antibiotics, um, because sometimes to add other antibiotics is just worsen the, the situation. But of course, uh, it's a decision to take really case by case. It's, it's not really possible to give a, a guideline on this, but this is a possibility. When we are really running out of uh, antibiotics, um, it's better to, to do a kind of washout, hoping that uh, or the, the infection will solve, or that at least after washout time, uh, we might lose some, uh, some resistant uh, bacteria instead of adding antibiotics that anyway will not work and will uh, give more side effect and we might create further resistances. So it is a possibility, but it is to be decided really case by case according with the bacteria that we suspect and according with the severity of the, the, the clinical uh, presentation, I think. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, um, from Arsenia Masinga. Yeah, um, I can see that, yeah. Yes, uh, regarding uh, uh, detection of AMR. Um, 
In this case, in our setting, we use disk diffusion to detect AMR, and we also use PCR to detect the mechanism of resistance genes. However, we find that some bacteria, we, de we detect the genes in them, but we do not detect the phenotype or vice versa. In this case, how can we define these bacteria? Are they resistant or not? And is it recommended to only use one method to detect AMR? Uh, this is a tricky question. So the phenotype can be of uh, different, for example, uh, yeah, so what I came to know from the literature are there are 2260 AMR resistant genes. So it is not easy to like detect all the resistant genes. Uh, but I would say that phenotype, uh, uh, phenotypic method is the best one uh, to detect because uh, PCR method is a little bit expensive. It might not be possible to detect all the resistant organisms so but only like uh, with the existing medicines that are present in the local lab or the local facility only it's better to like just to screen by disk diffusion of those antibiotics and then just to treat to, with that particular i think disk diffusion is sufficient to, to like treat the patient i think sometimes we don't know we don't need the genes that are resistant if they are like uh, sensitive, that is enough. Just we can treat the patient with that particular drug. Uh, I mean, this is what I would say. So it, it, uh, PCR can it increases only the cost. Sometimes it might not give us the answer. I would say that. Okay. Um, uh, if I can ask a follow-up question to that. Yeah. Um, uh, in cases uh, like uh, TB, where we have a very slow growing uh, bacterium, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they've been, you know, molecular methods, for example, uh, or genome sequencing using uh, yeah, 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 uh, right. nanotechnology. Would you, um, would you still uh, recommend the use of both, or, or, or we stick with um, um, the the classical uh, methods? Uh... I think, uh, yeah, in future, it is better to screen using uh, uh, next generation sequencing or whole genome to detect the genes, but it's, uh, it's time consuming and it's very expensive. And uh, how easy to like nail down a particular phenotype is still a tricky question. More data is needed to, to like come to the decisions. I wouldn't say that whole genome is just starting. It needs more time and more data like to be used to, for uh, accurately predict the resistant and then treat appropriately. Yeah, did I answer that question, John? Thank you. Yes, 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 you did. Thank you. Um, so we have another question um, from Christian Sidone. Yeah. Um, thank you, Reddy, for your presentation. I agree with you that uh, AMR's uh, uh, resistance depends on usage. Please, how do we make sure that antibiotic is used in, a, in an appropriate way to avoid resistance? Yeah, I mean, it all uh, depends on the, from the government, how to, I mean, uh, efficiently distribute, properly track how the antibiotics are used to make sure that uh, the antibiotics are not used uh, for the grow as a growth promoters or used unnecessarily uh, to like prevent the diseases in the animals um, or uh, and also like the, it, it should be made mandatory by the governments that uh, the prescription sh should be given only by uh, the drugs can be dis distributed only through prescriptions so these are the some of the mechanisms uh, and also to track that what is the consumption of which antibiotic where it is consumed which hospital is consumed i think the having all this data might help in uh, appropriately track and also whether there is a, to check the, the whether there is a correlation between the antibiotic usage in that particular hospital and uh, the resistant of that particular organism in that particular hospital so in this way it will, I think the data, uh, uh, we need data to take this decision. I would say that. Okay. We have another question from uh, Roland Mbikambika. Um, I would like to know if the Kirby Bauer method is sufficient to estimate impact of resistance at the hospital level. 
I am not a doctor like by seeing the, because I, I know theoretically maybe some doctor in the panel can answer this question. I would be happy. Anyone on the panel able to answer that question? Um, well, I don't understand very much the, the, the question because you say the Kirby Bauer method is sufficient to estimate the impact of resistance of resistance. So for me, it, it, it's uh, the, the, the impact of resistance at the hospital level can be evaluated with the, um, in many different ways. Of course, the, the lab is important, but there are other indicators that we can use to evaluate the, uh, the impact of resistance at the hospital, first of all is re really the, the trend of the infection that we see. And uh, so, and I think there can be different methods. I don't think there is only one method is really context related. What is important is to have a system of surveillance, let's say, possibly with a good lab, because of course, to, to monitor the uh, AMR, the lab is essential, but uh, I guess there are, are several possibilities. There is not only one method. The, the thing is to have a, a surveillance system in place so that if whatever method you use, but you, you see that there is an increasing trend of a certain uh, MR bacteria in your hospital, there is a problem. So, and then uh, the method I think is really related to the availability of the different lab uh, I, I'm not a lab person, but uh, I think there, there are alternative methods, not only Kirby Bauer, there are other, other methods as well. But the important is the, the surveillance system in place. I don't know if you agree, Srinivas. Uh... Yeah, 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 I agree with uh, that uh, because it all depends on the local data that we have and then only the doctor can assess that easily or the, yeah, yeah based on the data, I would say. Okay, um, we, we have um, a question here uh, for Kiara. Um, there are different levels of IPC in uh, different hospitals. Uh, if I'm looking to set up and strengthen IPC practices in my institute, what are the most vital steps I should take? Um, EG documentation, hand washing, cleaning program, ETC. Okay, so the, the uh, let's say the, the good success of IPC, I think it's really to be able to put in practice all of this. I mean, only one, one uh, activity is not enough. Mm, so it is important to put in place all the components that we mentioned before. So the administrative one, so to make so for me the number one, if I would be responsible, is to to decide who is responsible and to to give uh, a person really the accountability of this task, and make sure that uh, um, this person ensure a good training for the staff and uh, ensure that the proper equipment and material to ensure a good IPC is in place first of all. So this is the administrative organization of the hospital with someone responsible and uh, ensuring a good staff training and equipment. After that, for sure, there should be an antibiotic um, uh, stewardship. So a monitoring of the usage of antibiotics to put uh, a clear uh, um, and kind of standardized usage of antibiotics. Not uh, every doctor can decide uh, which antibiotic to give. So there should be a really a guideline following the uh, ecological uh, situation of the health structure. So this uh, is important. Uh, and then all the other things that we have mentioned. So the environmental control. So to make sure that the setup of the hospital is properly done and followed, that the flow is, is followed uh, and that all the um, precaution uh, are taken by all the personnel. So the, the proper PPE, the proper hand washing, all what we have said, the proper standard precaution are put in place. There is a proper waste management. 
So I guess my, I don't know if I answered the, the question, but the thing is only one component is not enough. It's important to put in place all, all the components. So that's why someone should coordinate all of them and uh, decide who is responsible for what and make sure that everything is, is well implemented. Uh, one thing is not enough, I would say. Okay, thank you so much. Um, there's a question, I think, for Srinivas and, and some later, if you've um, yeah. encountered this before, it's from an anonymous attendee. Um, they're asking, would it be nice to focus or have mathematical models for predicting resistance of bacteria to particular pathogens, uh, to predict when efficacy window of uh, an antibiotic will expire, provided natural selection is aiding, aiding in, the re in their resistance is constant. So I'm not sure if you come across any mathematical models for predicting resistance uh, or development of resistance in bacteria. Uh, at least I have never come across any paper, maybe I have missed, but I would say that, uh, yeah, at least some data points, antibiotics, so I think it's a very complex thing because it's very, very difficult to do even mathematical modeling because uh, it is in the animals, uh, it is in the environment, it is in the hospital, so I think... Uh, uh, I don't know whether the models can really can give the right answer, but it's a, it will be a very complex mathematical model to do, I would say. It's not an easy thing to do, to model. That's, that's true. <laughs> models have been proven wrong before. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, at least they will give, sorry, I mean, at least they will give us a direction uh, to what extent, but numbers cannot be trusted, but still at least, at least it will give some uh, kind of idea. Okay, sorry, John, please go on. No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> um, I have another question here. What collaborations are needed to achieve a One Health approach to AMR resistance in Africa from Ishmael Conte? So this would be better for the panelists who have been in Africa, but I have never been to Africa, so I cannot answer. Please, some of the panelists who have been all, uh, already there in the Africa and who knows better about Africa would be better to answer this question. Uh, Samuleta and Ken, uh, you are Africa specialists. Do you have any <laughs> response for that? Ken, Samuleta? Yes. Yes, oh, okay. one health approach. I don't think I don't think there is one health approach for for, uh, for solutions. Um, the solution is just what um, the Tiaras and Dr. Sreni was talking about. Multi multi approach. There is no one health approach. Mm. Yeah, if, if I might uh, add uh, something, I think that uh, regarding uh, antimicrobial resistance, uh, uh, one health approach is important not only in Africa, but everywhere. For example, we see here how much uh, uh, is the usage of antibiotics uh, uh, for the animals for in the um, in the farmers, in the fish, in the in the animals, and these is used in the, in the animals and uh, um, it can create antibiotic resistance. And then we eat this meat and we eat this fish. And so uh, just to say that, uh, yes, the antimicrobial resistance doesn't, doesn't involve only human beings, but also animals. So that's why uh, one health approach, including also the veterinary side uh, would be important. And, and then, of course, the idea is they collaborate. And so there is a, a sharing of information and knowledge in between the two worlds. But uh, yes, the antimicrobial mm. resistance doesn't, doesn't involve only human beings, this for sure. So we have to consider the animal uh, world as well. Uh, can I get in? Okay, to... maybe. Oh, okay, sorry. Could I, could I add something? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. All right, thanks. So since the question was specific about Africa, currently there have been a few centers of excellence that have been um, put up. So currently there's one at the University of Zambia in the School 
of veterinary medicine we, who are focusing on studying infectious diseases in animals and humans. So this has brought collaboration between the human scientists and the veterinary scientist resistance, both in humans and in animals. So basically we're studying uh, zoonosis as well as um, some uh, neglected tropical diseases. So I think there is an effort to try and tackle antimicrobial resistance from a One Health approach in Africa. How bad is just starting? So we probably need to strengthen such uh, centers of excellence. So can Thank you, I add something here? Yes, university can yeah, answer. Can, like, I agree with you that, uh, I mean, currently no One Health approaches are present in Africa, as far as my knowledge is concerned. It's all like we have to build up because, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the Center for Excellences as well as Canton. So these are all the partners uh, we have to discuss among ourselves. Uh, and then like we have to initiate and bring people together, create some website or some uh, center, something who can coordinate. So in this way, it's, it's a beginning, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question on AMR during pregnancy. Um, shouldn't we treat, uh, what, what, to, what should we do uh, about AMR during pregnancy. Shouldn't we treat or practice a kind of washout like Dr. Kiara said, uh, when we know that there are some risks for the outcome? I, I'm assuming it's the outcome of the pregnancy that the, um, the, yeah. uh, the, the attendant is, is asking. Um, okay. Dr. Kiara? Yeah, so I think um, I answer in the same way. We really have to evaluate case by case. I mean, many antibiotics can be safely used in pregnancy. So, not, so then, of course, we have to, use, to choose the one uh, that can be safely used in pregnancy. Um, but, of course, we have to be more, more, uh, even more attentive to uh, choose the right one. Uh, and if and so that's why it's important to evaluate uh, the severity of disease. What's happening if we don't treat the woman to her and to the baby to the pregnancy? And what's happened to if we use uh, certain antibiotics to the woman and to the to the fetus? So and then we have to wait uh, uh, pro and cons. But what is important is really to, to see uh, which is the, the type of infection and also. Uh, in just just to remind, we don't have to treat all the bacteria that we found that the lab uh, report to us. We have to to treat the bacteria who are giving a disease to a, to a patient. So some of the bacteria are colonizer. Let's so they are there in the in the body, but they don't cause uh, disease. So in this case, we don't need to treat them. Even here in Italy, for example, we have many patients colonized with the Klebsiella, uh, multi-drug resistant Klebsiella. We don't treat them because they are, uh, let's say, carrier. They are not symptomatic. So we uh, isolate them to avoid that they, they spread, they transmit the infection to someone else, but we don't treat them because we don't have antibiotics anymore. And, but especially because in that moment, this bacteria is a colonizer, means that he lives there in the body, but without uh, giving disease. So we are full of, let's say, good bacteria in our body. We don't have to kill all the bacteria <laughs> that we have. Some are useful for us or some someone are not harmful, let's say. So we need to treat diseases. We don't need to treat bacteria. This is important. And in pregnancy, even more because of course there is one risk more which is the related to the pregnancy but i would say i, I would use the same uh, concept even in pregnancy of course choosing among the antibiotics which we can safely use in pregnancy thank you so much dr Montalzo. um we have a question about um uh dr Montaldo. what do you think about the skin uh, hand microbiota in terms of hand washing with soap and water and the application of hand sanitizers. 
Yeah, so um, even, even this, I mean, we don't need to have uh, sterile hands. Uh, our skin is not sterile, it, it doesn't need to be. So the, the, the meaning of uh, hand washing, which can be done safely most of the time with soap and water, uh, with for some uh, germs with the with the alcohol based solution uh, as the uh, purpose to kill those bacteria who can um, who can uh, provoke uh, uh, diseases not every bacteria we are full of staphylococcus and other bacteria on our hands again we don't need to have sterile hands um, and, and it's good to, to keep our microbiota, as you, as you mentioned, in the, you know, on our skin. So normally, just to give a simple uh, direction, soap and water are very good normally, most of the time. It's just maybe not always feasible because in some setting you don't have soap and water in each room of, uh, of each patient. But if we have, it's, it's very good. Eh? Uh, then... Uh, second choice can be the hand sanitizer, which are disinfectant, and we can use it replacing soap and water when we don't have the availability in every room. So I think that if we use it correctly in between each patient, whatever we use, soap and water or hand sanitizer, it's, uh, it's fine and... Uh, and we keep still our microbiota on, on the skin. We, the, the, the message is really this, we don't need the sterile end. Thank you, Dr. Vendado. Um, We have a question from Grace who asks, does the chain of resistance include consumption of plants? I guess any of the panelists can answer this um, question. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, to, to be honest, I'm, I don't know if we can make the same uh, uh, reflection that we made on uh, animal words. So uh, regarding animals, uh, the usage of antibiotics is, is very spread and uh, is huge and uh, has a big impact on the human health. But uh, regarding plants, I don't know, not uh, on my knowledge, but... Uh, I might be wrong, so no. I, I don't think anyway that the size of the problem is so big as it is for, for animal words. Uh, can I like uh, say something? Yes, yes please, Renabeth, please. Uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, they will not directly cause, but uh, like when farmers spray this manure that has antibiotic resistant bacteria that comes from the, from the animals, so usually like when animals are treated with antibiotics, so they excrete the bacteria that are resistant and the manure has uh, uh, the antibiotics as well as uh, the antibiotic resistant bacteria. When these are sprayed in the fields, so they might somehow come in contact with the vegetables and then this is how they enter into the market. Like they get contaminated with antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, and then, uh, yeah, when they, it enters into the food chain and then they might like spread to humans and then this is how the spread might happen. Not, not directly from the plants, but uh, the exposure of the plants and vegetables uh, to this kind of uh, bacteria might cause this uh, resistance, I would say that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think the two last questions in my uh Field of view have already been answered. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we have 10 minutes or so left. Um, if anyone has any uh, uh, verbal questions that they would like to ask the panelists, you can raise your hands um, and we'll, um, we'll uh, pick you um, to ask a verbal question to, to the panelists. So if anyone has any question to ask, um, they can raise their hands now. Um, if not, we will then proceed to um, our break. So does anyone have any further questions for the panelists and the presenters? Hi, hi John, it's Mags. There was a question in the chat and I'm not sure whether it's been answered from somebody from Gabon, Philippe from CR. 
C-I-R-M-F. Hello, Philippe. And the question was, how long after antibiotic use is continued, uh, but is, is discontinued, bacteria resistance could lose the resistance? Ah, okay. So uh, how long after antibiotic, uh, um, an antibiotic drug is uh, discontinued in use? Will yeah. sensitive bacteria uh, appear? Okay. Um, uh, Sunivas, any any comments on that question? Uh, I don't have because it all depends. Uh, so sorry. So I don't have like right answer for that. I would say. If anybody can, the panel can answer that. That would be great. I yeah. I don't uh, think that there is a right uh, answer uh, I, because I think it's really depend on the on the bacteria on the type of resistance uh, um, on how long uh, the antibiotics has been used so I think it depends on many factors and there is no a fixed time it, it change for for among bacteria among type of resistance and even in the same bacteria i don't think there is a fixed time uh, for that i agree with kaira <laughs> thank you any other questions okay um i don't see any raised hands so at this point, um, I don't know, Mags, can we go to sorry, a break? Sorry to interrupt, John. Um, yeah, Christiane Sidoni's hand is raised. Ah, okay. I didn't see that. Yeah. Uh, could you unmute him, uh, Heather? Yeah, I've un unmuted Christiane now. Uh, Christian, you can go ahead and ask your question. So Christian has to unmute first. Christian, uh, are you still on mute? Or you can unmute your microphone now. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Christian. We can't hear you, Christian. Is it? It might it be your connection? Maybe if you type your question in the Q and A box, we can. We'll, we might be able to see it. Oh, okay. Um, I'm gathering that uh, uh, it was it was a mistake. Uh, he raised his hand in error. Um, we have a question from Guy Arnott. Um, is there an analytical approach to track the beginning of resistance? Uh, events. Yeah, I think an analytical it's, approach? Really, it's very difficult to answer this because it all depends on the, the type of antibiotic, the class of antibiotic, because, uh, yeah, whether, yeah, I mean, basically whole genome sequencing, uh, yeah, if we see some resistance for particular antibiotic against particular organism, then the beginning will be like to pinpoint uh, what is the real uh, mechanism behind the development of the resistance. I think uh, there is no particular time point. It all depends on the data. So as the diagnostic screening goes, if more and more cases of resistance for, for that particular antibiotic develops over time, then it's the start, uh, starting point to beginning to start screening the resistant. Once this beginning happens, then uh, parallelly some research has to go on what is the uh, resist resistant behind the, me the mechanism behind the resistance. In this way, we can uh, yeah, start to how to track the resistance. I think there is no particular time. It all depends on the usage as well as uh, the data that develops over time uh, based on the screen of that particular antibiotic. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, yep, I think we've come to the end of the questions. Um, I don't have any raised hands. We have four minutes till break. Um, any additional questions, Mags, uh, um, that you've seen in the chat? I'm just looking through um, the chat. Can hi there. Hi, John. I'm not sure whether this one had been. Hi there. Another one from Guy. I don't know whether Guy wants to come online. It was about diffusion and dilution methods. Are they the gold standard for, um, for AMR? Ah, okay. I thought that one had been answered. Oh, um, maybe it I had, think... and I've missed it. Apologies. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 I just remember that I didn't ask it. Um, so any of us, um, is, is uh, diffusion and dilution methods, are they the gold standard for AMR? Uh, I would say uh, that, to, yeah, I mean, uh, I adjusted the red theoretically. I don't know the real uh, thing, what goes on in the clinic. As far as I read the literature, these are the two different methods that are like used mostly by most of the labs currently. I would say that. I, then, yeah, I mean, based on the literature, I would say that these are the gold standards for uh, uh, checking the resistance or susceptibility of the bacteria. Yeah. So anything, uh, Dr. Kaira, regarding this? No. I I also think are the gold standard, but uh, yeah, as I said, I'm not really a lab person, but are normally the method that I see I see to be used. So I guess they are the gold standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think things will change over time. The gold standard might be tomorrow a different technique, and then yep. you have to because I, I would agree with quite both dramatically. Of you, uh, in my experience, though. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, looking to see if there are any more questions. I don't see any raised hands. I'm looking through the chats. Um, there's one, no Anye, there's one from Anye Delphine, Anye Delphine Tango. Okay. Right. Anye is All asking. Right. That, that will be our last question. Yeah. Go ahead, Ken. Anye is asking, Anye Dolph, Delphine is asking, how can you really monitor antibiotic resistance in resource limited settings? Um, yep. I'll direct that question to Trinivas. And, and uh, okay, so let me try to answer. It's not a straightforward answer. <laughs> what I would say that uh, it's good to have some data on what kind of resistances are present in that particular uh, country or locality. Based on that, I think localized diagnostics need to be developed by our PCR or something. Only limited assays can be done. So in this way, then uh, only for that particular priority, it can be prioritized. For example, there are 10 antibiotics. So top three are the most commonly anti-resistant VC. Then it's better to spend all the resources on these three and then screen. And then this is how I would say that I would limit the resources only for three than screening 10 because the probability of finding in the other seven uh, uh, antibiotics might be one or two. So in that way, like uh, the decision can be made based on the priorities. Only three or four can be selected and then only these common resistances can be screened, I would say. Yeah, John, this is what I can yeah, say. Thank you. Thank you, Srinivas. Um, tomorrow, uh, during the surveillance uh, uh, presentations, um, we will also talk about um, uh, continued how continued surveillance can be carried out in resource-limited yeah. settings. Um, so um, that question will be dealt with uh, in, in detail tomorrow as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think. Um, so at this point, we reached We've reached the end of the Q&A session. Um, we're going to go for a break. Um, I'm just looking up to see how long our break is supposed to be. Um, it's supposed to be 15 minutes from now till, till 11.15. Um, 
So looking forward to seeing you all back here at 11.15. Um, we will now go on our 15 minute break. Thank you everyone for uh, your attention. Thank you for, to the presenters for your presentations. Um, see you back here in 15 minutes. Um, welcome back from the break. Um, as John said, thank you, thank you very much to John for sharing that first session and for wonderful presentations there from Kiara and from Srinivas. Um, I think that's got our workshop up, off to a great start. Thank you so much, everybody, for all your questions. So I think now everybody's seen how this works so that you can post your questions um, in, the, in the chat. Sorry, in the Q&A, excuse me. Uh, but you can also then, we, we can use the chat as well to, to speak to each other. So we're going to move on to our second session now. Um, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Ken, Ken Awando. Ken is actually, um, Ken, I haven't actually got any blurb about you, Ken, but um, Ken was a laboratory manager at K Khalifi at the Kemri Wellcome Trust in Khalifi. Um, and, and I know Ken from uh, doing some clinical trials there. And Ken is now part of um, the Global Health Network, uh, working for the Global Health Network. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Ken for this uh, second session. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much, Max, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kiara and Dr. Srinivas, for setting the background for the discussion. Over the next one hour and 15 minutes, we, will, we want to shift the gear to infection prevention and controlling measures on the world. And our presenter is going to be uh, Lizzie. Uh, Lizzie, she's called, her full name is Boyeshua. Lizzie Sitole Mazubuko. Mazibuko. Lizzie is based in Zimbabwe. Uh, Lizzie Sitole is a seasoned uh, infectious prevention control specialist and a hand hygiene champion for Africa. She has a postgraduate diploma in infection control and currently studying um, for the, an MBA in leadership and sustainability. She works for Infection Control Africa Network, uh, that is ICANN, as a training coordinator consultant. She was actively involved in the West African Ebola response in Sierra Leone and worked as a technical advisor for IPC under WHO. She is a certified trainer on hand hygiene compliance monitoring uh, WHO collaborating center she is also involved in rolling out the hand hygiene trainings across Africa amongst other training programs. She is also actively involved in the training and mentoring of health community workers on IPC practices during the care of COVID-19 patients. Uh, Lizzie uh, Stolle will take us through infectious prevention and control measures on the world. And she will talk about uh, the importance of correct hand washing procedures personal protective equipment role, uh, maintaining cleanliness of equipment, isolation of patients and contract tracing, screening and barrier to infection prevention and control implementation. Without taking much time, I hand over to uh, Lizzie Sitole. Lizzie, please take over. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ken, and uh, welcome back everyone. I'm going to share my screen and uh, my talk, as Ken said, is about uh, the infection control in a ward situation. So for the brief outline of the lecture, I'm going to talk about hand hygiene. I'm going to also briefly talk about the role which uh, personal protective equipment plays. And I will talk about the decontamination of medical devices. 
I will touch a bit on uh, the cohort and isolation and also upon barriers of IPC implementation. So just uh, to kickstart the talk, um, what is a ward? The ward is a dedicated area in the healthcare facility where inpatients are housed. It contains beds and it may also uh, have acute services such as an emergency department, an operating theater, or an intensive care unit, as well as a range of medical specialty departments. And then for hand hygiene, we, uh, we know that hand hygiene uh, reduces the transmission of organisms from uh, uh, the hands, and uh, especially when uh, we are now dealing with uh, COVID-19 or mostly uh, the other outbreaks, we encourage healthcare workers in the community not to touch their face, that is the eyes, the nose, the mouth, before performing hand hygiene. And if it means you have to touch it inevitable uh, during uh, this COVID-19 pandemic, you should um, make sure that uh, your hand hygiene practices are very meticulous. So the methods of hand hygiene practices that are mostly used um, in uh, uh, the world as uh, the use of the alcohol-based hand wrap, which has uh, become the gold standard because uh, alcohol is very fast it, uh, uh, and is very rapid and very effective. There's also hand, uh, hand washing with soap and water. And uh, in some of the low middle income settings, they use chlorine to uh, wash the hands. But uh, the important take home message about any hand hygiene product is uh, it must be effective and it must meet the required standards. It should be screen, uh, skin friendly and should be accepted by the healthcare workers widely. And then for the transmission dynamics, of uh, why uh, the hands become a source of contamination. And I'm going to relate it with the current uh, COVID-19 uh, um, uh, scenario. First and foremost, we start with uh, the organisms from the patient or the skin or the body fluid and surroundings. This is where there is uh, uh, the patient's flora in the patient's zone. Remember the patient's zone is uh, the place in which uh, a patient uh, the space in which the patient is being nursed. It contains uh, the patient, the bed, and any care equipment that is exclusively dedicated to the patient during the time of hospitalization. So it is um, assumed that that area is predominantly having the patient's own flora. And then the second um, step is during care activity, the healthcare worker will then pick up the germs or the microorganisms from the patient's uh, zone or patient space. And then uh, as we know, um, microorganisms survive in the hands for uh, a range of about two to 60 minutes. And if it means that you have inadequate or defective hand hygiene practices, or what we call the missed opportunity, then the organisms will continue um, surviving and multiplying in your hands. And then because your hands are still contaminated as a healthcare worker and you have other care activities, you can then move whatever you have in your hands, either through direct or indirect contact with another susceptible host, in this case, it might be the next patient or it might be other healthcare workers or the environment. And then we also to discuss effective hand hygiene to take place. We also have to know the factors that reduce hand hygiene effectiveness. First and foremost, I'd like to talk about our rings and the jewelry. And uh, according to studies, uh, it has been shown that rings and the bracelets actually increase the microbial count on the hand, and they also increase the risk of torn or pierced gloves. Hence, uh, jewelry should not be worn during patient care activities. But there are some instances where a bracelet may not be removed due to religious reasons. So we encourage that you can uh, push the bracelet uh, as high as possible above the wrist and perform uh, hand hygiene. Or alternatively, you can apply a waterproof proof dressing to actually cover that bracelet. And then the other factor which reduces hand hygiene effectiveness is the skin integrity. 
So the condition of, of the hands can actually influence the effectiveness of hand hygiene. So proper skin care is basically essential. So if you have uh, cracks, if you have dermatitis or cuts, uh, cuts can actually trap the bacteria and they may place patients at an increased risk. The other uh, um, factors are the artificial nails and the nail extenders because uh, the artificial nails or the nail extenders increase the viral load of bacteria up to nine times compared with uh, the bacteria found in, in hands. And uh, we encourage that the nails should be kept at a maximum of quarter inch long and they should not extend past the, the end of the finger. We also have uh, water, uh, the water temperature in products. If uh, the warm water removes less protective oils than hot water, but uh, hot water increases the likelihood of skin uh, damage. So you have to have the rightful temperature of water if it means you are washing your hands using soap and water. And then to prevent the contamination, the products must be dispensed in a disposable pump uh, that is not topped up. And uh, in this case, it refers to your uh, uh, standing alcohol based hand wraps or your soap dispensers. And then uh, you should apply an adequate amount of soap, which is required to dissolve uh, the fatty materials and the oils from your hands, as uh, water alone is not sufficient to clean the soiled hands. And then for the five moments of hand hygiene, we know that the first two, that is before touching a patient and before a clean aseptic procedure, are actually meant to protect the patient. And uh, we perform the hand hygiene uh, actions uh, for those indications because we do not want to introduce whatever we are carrying in our hands as healthcare workers to the patients. And then for moment three, four, and five, moment three being after body fluid exposure risk, moment four being after touching a patient, and moment five being after touching patient's uh, surroundings without physically touching the patient. These are meant to protect the healthcare worker and the environment from uh, the patient's uh, aura. So what you have picked up as a healthcare worker during care activities, you then have to perform a hand hygiene action so that you make sure that you clean your hands. And uh, earlier on, uh, I talked about the patient zone in the healthcare area. And so the patient zone is defined as uh, the patient and the surfaces that uh, and the items that are temporarily and exclusively dedicated to him or her. And the patient zone actually has two critical sites, which is the clean site or the body fluid site. So, and um, as we said uh, earlier on, is uh, that the patient flora predominantly and contaminates this zone. And it is where the concept of the five moments are actually derived from, because the five moments have to happen as you deliver the care of the patient. And then outside the patient zone is what is referred to as the healthcare area. So the healthcare area contains all surfaces in the healthcare setting outside the patient zone of patient X, and it includes other patients and their patient zone and the wider healthcare facility environment. This uh, area is actually characterized by the presence of the various and numerous microbial species, including those multi-resistant germs. And then we talk of point of care. It refers to a place where three elements occur together. That is the patient, the healthcare worker, and the care or the treatment involving patient uh, uh, contact. And the concept embraces the need to perform hand hygiene at the recommended moments, exactly where care delivery takes place. So this is where your WHO five moments come in. And uh, point of care requires a hand hygiene product, for an example, an alcohol-based hand wrap, to be easily accessible as close as possible. That is within uh, arm's reach. And uh, you should access it without having to leave the patient zone so that you do not forget to clean or disinfect your hands. And then on how to uh, hand wrap technique, um, 
you have to pour alcohol-based dandruff into uh, cupped hands and you start with your fingertips first because uh, according to recent studies that were done, there was actually an increased, uh, sorry, a decrease in the uh, bacterial log count if it meant that you start uh, the technique with your fingertips first. And then you can follow with the palm to palm and then the web of the fingers, the back of the hands, and lastly, the thumbs. And once the alcohol uh, based end wrap is dry, that is when you can do uh, proceed to do your activities. Another practice which should uh, opt is uh, for somebody to first use soap and water and they, thereafter use a, an alcohol based end wrap. It has no added benefit. It's either you are performing hand hygiene using an alcohol based end wrap only or you are using um, soap and water. And then for the instances whereby it is not uh, proper to use an alcohol-based end wrap, it is when your hands are visibly soiled, that's number one. And two, if you are dealing with uh, spore-forming organisms, for example, the C. diff, because uh, alcohol is not effective against spores, if you are coming from the toilet also, you cannot use uh, uh, alcohol-based hand wrap, and you can also not use alcohol-based hand wrap on gloved hands. You can also not use uh, alcohol-based hand wrap after removing powdered gloves. And then for the, sorry, for the hand washing procedure, it, um, you have to first wet your hands, and then you can apply the soap, and then you follow the, uh, the six steps to the effective hand washing and ensure that you dry your hands thoroughly before you move on to the next activity. And the, uh, the reason why it is important also to practice the proper hand hygiene technique, it is because there's most of the times we have the areas that are either at the back of the hand or at the front of the hand that are usually forgotten. And as you can see in the left side where there is a, a picture there, it is in one of the training sessions where we apply a cloth gel, which mimics some viruses. And we ask the healthcare worker to then perform hand, hand hygiene uh, through hand washing. And then thereafter, we can then allow them to put their hands under UV light. And uh, uh, the areas that are glowing means it's um, the areas which still have contamination. Hence, it is very important for us to ensure that we follow the proper hand hygiene technique. Then we move on to the roles of personal protective equipment. And for us to effectively uh, utilize pers personal protective equipment, we have to do what we call point of care risk assessment. This will actually enable you as uh, a healthcare worker to identify the additional steps that are needed to be taken to protect yourself, to protect the patients or others in the environment. That is the other staff, visitors, family or caregivers. And you have to ask yourselves the following questions before you don any PPE. First, what contact will you have with the patient? And what is the likely infection, which is the mode of transmission? The next, you have to ask yourself, what procedure are you going to perform? Is there any risk of splashes, a spray, needle stick, inhalation, or aerosols? And then if you have answered those uh, three questions, then you can then use the available means of preventing or minimizing the risk. That is choosing the correct personal protective equipment. And then for the personal protective equipment, you have to put it on to avoid contact with blood or other body fluids, to avoid respiratory secretions or excretions, and uh, also the mucous membranes and non-intact skin of the patient. And it has to be put on according to the uh, anticipated contact. And uh, what we should know is that uh, PPE is always procedure-based. You have to don or put on the PPE before the procedure and you have to remove it directly thereafter and perform hand hygiene. And also of note is that we should remember that instruments, equipment, 
the linen supplies and hard surfaces can be contaminated with blood and body fluids as well. And what we should know is that the contamination is not always feasible. And then for us to effectively use personal protective equipment, we have to follow or observe some rules. First and foremost is that uh, PPE can be a transmitter of microbes when contaminated. So hence, we have to follow the proper procedures for donning and doffing because failure to that, you can have chances of contaminating yourself if it means uh, during the process of removal or what other people call doffing. And then the use of PPE to allay personal prejudice or fear without indication for a procedure can sometimes increase the risk of infection. Like uh, what we've seen of late when it comes to uh, dealing with COVID-19, we have seen some practices whereby healthcare workers are even putting on double masks and it, uh, surgical mask, and it has no added benefit at all. And um, what we should also know, especially important, is that uh, PPE is not a substitute for poor infection control practices, right, or a nursing procedure. So in the hierarchy of controls, PPE usually comes last, because you first have to deal with your um, administrative controls, your in, uh, engineering or environmental controls, and once those are in place, then you can then use your PPE effectively. And then also all personal protective equipment have a limited life and they must be discarded after use as indicated. And this is usually after each patient use. And then for the first levels of care and the risk when it comes to uh, COVID-19, if you are in the triage area, you have to perform your hand hygiene as indicated and put on a medical mask, it will suffice. And then if you are collecting specimens for lab diagnosis, you still have to perform your hand hygiene. You have to don a glove, you have to put on an, a respirator and you have to put on eye protection and some gloves. And uh, if you are looking after a suspected or, co or confirmed case of COVID-19, and uh, but not carrying out any aerosol generating procedures, you have to perform your hand hygiene, you don your, your, your gown, you put on your medical mask and your uh, goggles and the gloves. But however, if it means that you are performing aerosol generating procedures, you then have to use a, a respirator instead. And then uh, the PPE, as we said, we are looking at mostly the contact and the droplet uh, precautions. And we say that this is based on the risk assessment of the type and duration of exposure to body fluids. And uh, as healthcare workers, you should put on your gowns, your medical masks and the gloves, and uh, you should put on the eye protection at the boots and coveralls and are uh, not required during routine care of a COVID-19 uh, patient. So basically we have a golden rule in IPC, whereas uh, I can, we usually show this face to say, remember that this is the part, the face and your hands are what basically need protection from uh, uh, COVID-19. And then for the airborne precaution, you have to use eye protection, you have to put on your goggles or a, or a shield, and you have to wear a non-sterile long-sleeved gown and gloves. And if the gown is not fluid resistant, you can use a waterproof apron uh, for procedures that are expected to create high volumes of fluid, which can penetrate the gown. And then uh, what is also important is you have to limit the number of staff in the room to the absolute minimum. That is, you only allow those that need to be there. And then you have to clean your hands either through hand washing or using an alcohol-based hand wrap according to the five moments of hand hygiene. We move on to the isolation of patients. Isolation is the separation of people with uh, communicable diseases from those who are healthy. It's, all, it's used to limit the transmission of infectious diseases and this is based on the roots of transmission of the organisms. 
And uh, there are three major types of transmission-based precautions, which are contact, droplet, and, air and airborne isolation precautions, of which we all know as um, uh, infection control practitioners that uh, we mostly have uh, problems with uh, contact precautions as uh, uh, the contact means of uh, transmission accounts to about 80 to 85% of all healthcare associated infections. And in COVID-19, uh, we are using uh, the droplet and contact uh, precautions, and we apply the airborne precautions when performing the aerosol generating procedures in the healthcare setting. Then um, if it means you do not have um, a single isolation uh, units, you can practice cohorting, which is a grouping of the patients who are infected with the same pathogen in the same location so that you confine the eye care to one area and you prevent uh, contact with the other patients. And this is actually part of a, hier a hierarchy of patient placement decisions uh, for patients requiring care. And you can cohort in a ward or in a bay within a ward or in a community facility, for example, in a hall or a tent. It's actually conducive for you to cohort. And in cohort in COVID-19, the cohort is a group of uh, a lab confirmed patients. Cohorting on its own is not sufficient. It should be combined with other infection control measures, for example, a hand hygiene, proper use of personal protective equipment, and environmental decontamination. And the beds should be separated by at least three feet, which is approximately one meter from the edge or two, two and a half meters from the center of one bed to the center of the other. And um, if possible, you should uh, have a team of healthcare staff that are dedicated to care for those particular patients so that you minimize the risk of contaminating different groups. And uh, the types of isolation facilities that are available, you can have specialized units which have uh, negative pressure uh, rooms that utilize mechanical ventilation. You can have uh, the single rooms with an ensuite facility. It could be a, a wall ward, as in uh, those that are found in an infectious disease hospital. It could be uh, a community hall, which has been uh, uh, set to be uh, a makeshift uh, isolation area. It could be the tents, or it could be hotels that are repurposed as isolation centers to meet to, uh, the demand during an outbreak. I think we have seen all this happening in our respective countries where we are coming from. And um, if uh, uh, the, there are other isolation hospitals, this can be built for a particular type of infection. For example, you can have an Ebola layout, cholera layout, or a, 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 a SARI center. And then I uh, can isolate in a healthcare facility or in the community. And it should, be seg it should be a segregated area which is not frequented by outsiders or visitors because we do not, we are trying by all means to minimize the spread of that infection. It should be located close to an intensive care unit for easy transfer of patients who become critically ill. That is, if this is possible. It should have uh, access to clean running water, very important uh, for us to address uh, the wash issues because if they are not uh, addressed properly, we can have uh, another outbreak in the middle of an outbreak. And it should have clear signage, uh, the whole area indicating the, the space for isolation and the direction of flow, especially for patients, for staff and for equipment. This is uh, very, very important so that you, uh, you have a unidirectional uh, flow and avoid moving from clean, uh, from dirty back to clean areas. Then uh, these isolation centers should also be co-located with post-surgical wards if, uh, if possible. Uh, sorry, they should not be co-located with post-surgical wards they should not be near the labor wards or neonatal units, or they should not be located near vulnerable patients. If uh, 
possible, the access to the isolation ward should be through a dedicated lift or an area or guarded steps so that we minimize the number of people visiting that area. The entry and the exit doors should be separate and clearly marked, as I mentioned, so that uh, we uh, maintain the unidirectional flow. And the facility should have appropriate flooring material, adequate floor space for the beds, adequate hand washing stations, a standard lab if possible, proper workstations, and uh, most importantly, adequate ventilation and also paste and rodent control. The layout should have a patient waiting area or a reception whereby uh, the patients uh, uh, come in and then they should be immediately triaged and then they should be an area where they are handed over into the ward where there will be uh, uh, care will take place. There should be a staff area for donning and doffing of uh, PPE. They should be uh, suspected or confirmed wards or rooms. They should be discharge area and uh, also the access to the morgue, to the lab or pharmacy and laundry should be clearly marked. And uh, most importantly, we should also have a dedicated waste management area and also a cleaner store in low and high risk areas. In addition to this, you have to uh, make sure that um, you uh, create space for staff to have a resting room. And um, this is one example of a, a single room isolation area where uh, with an ensuite and um, it should be well ventilated. And uh, when we are looking at uh, ventilation, we are uh, assuming that it should be having uh, about 60 liters of uh, air per second for the patient and the doors must always be shut. And then uh, there is the ideal natural ventilation and the one for uh, mechanical ventilation. So in the ideal ventilation, the air should move from uh, the corridor going into the, the isolation area and come out through the windows or through the toilet. The airflow should not be making its way back into the clinical areas or into the corridor. And then for the mechanical ventilation, you have to have a monitored system of negative air pressure with uh, about 12 air changes per hour, and it should uh, uh, discharge of air outdoors, or you can use uh, the high efficiency particulate uh, uh, filters in the room, and the doors should always remain closed. The principles that we should uh, follow the external air should be delivered to each part of the space in an efficient manner, and uh, it should be a uh, flow from top to bottom. And if uh, you should have an extractor fan, which is at least about 20 centimeters above the ground. And in the clinical setting, we should not be having any air conditioners because uh, what uh, the air conditioners do is uh, just to warm up or to cool down and recirculate the same dirty air in the room. And these are some of the examples of um, the isolation wards that are found uh, in Africa. The first one with the blue beds there, it is a, a, a tent, a very big uh, tent that has been uh, um, turned into an isolation unit. And as you can see, there is a proper bed spacing there. And uh, in the second area, this is uh, sort of like a, a poor um, setup because the windows are supposed to be opened, but because it was a, a cold day, the patients decided to close the window. And this can happen if it means that we do not educate the patients on the importance of ventilation. And then on the lower end, it's an, uh, a, a typical uh, isolation unit whereby there is uh, proper lighting and the windows have been opened to aid in ventilation. And for the administrative controls, you should have uh, policies, procedures, and guidelines in place. And this should be uh, written clear and should be uh, understood by everyone who is working in that particular uh, ward or isolation area. 
and you should ensure that there is adequate patient to staff ratio and with well-defined roles and uh, responsibilities. Uh, you should also take care of the logistics and the supplies of uh, the infection prevention and control materials. That is uh, the personal protective equipment, the alcohol-based end wrap, the soap, and other supplies that we are using. And uh, you should have a, a triage and uh, institute uh, the standard and transmission-based precautions. And uh, if there is time before you admit your uh, patients, you should have uh, a simulation to find out that if you are to admit a suspected or confirmed patient, what is going to happen. And then you schedule also the training of the staff. This has to be on-job training. And uh, yeah, it's important for, for you to also train them on the procedures and the type of PPE, and most, uh, most importantly, the cleaning procedures that should be done. And then they should also have um, uh, 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 an incident register whereby um, people uh, fill in their details and also any incidences of note that can be happening. You also have to have IEC materials and uh, if possible in the local languages so that uh, people are, are able to read and understand what uh, should be happening. And then uh, for the engineering controls, you have to have the maintenance of the ventilation. You also have to pay attention to waste uh, the waste management system. Because remember you are handling uh, waste, which we, we do not want to see uh, finding its way into the community in any way. And uh, if it's in a very hot, humid area, you can provide the patients with nets so that uh, they are protected against mosquitoes and some insects. You maintain uh, the wash facilities, that is your water and uh, uh, sanitation and hygiene. And uh, you have to keep the records of any repairs or, mod or modifications of what has happened in that particular unit. And then in summary, we are saying that in the isolation center, we need a well-defined space with staff areas that are separate from other patient areas. They should be clearly designated with sign you should have a separate entrance and e exit for the staff and the patients. It should be a good layout, which is free of clutter to enhance patient and workflow. And the patients should be able to move from the, uh, the ambulance area to the isolation area without not going through other areas of the facility. And then for the instruments and the equipment, they should be a dedicated furniture, dedicated medical equipment, dedicated cleaning or decontaminating equipment and materials so that we reduce the risk of cross transmission. And um, if possible, uh, you can use uh, single use items. And uh, in summary, we're also saying that uh, they should be adequate, well aerated uh, changing rooms for the medical staff. There should be enough space for uh, doffing and donning with the uh, proper hand hygiene uh, facilities. And this should be clearly separated from the patient area and the PPE should be stored in shelves and uh, they should be waste bins for disposal of the contaminated PPE. You should have uh, adequate supplies for patient care and uh, you should have proper storage uh, facilities for the supplies and above all, good ventilation. And then for the staff that are working in an isolation area, um, the contact and the droplet precautions are recommended for all the patients with suspected or COVID-19 and uh, the airborne precautions, we said they're recommended for when you're performing aerosol generating uh, procedures or where there is uh, poor ventilation. And um, if possible, you should uh, nurse your patient in a single room if not possible, you can then uh, cohort. And uh, the healthcare workers should put on PPE appropriately and also ensure that uh, they remove PPE uh, according to the required uh, checklist. And if possible, you should have a body system in, in place. Hand hygiene should be done anytime with the WHO five moments. And uh, you should uh, also, before applying and removing PPE, hand hygiene should be done properly. For the patient transport, you should avoid moving and transporting patients out of their rooms or areas unless it is medically necessary. 
And if it is necessary, you have to use a predetermined route and um, the staff have to uh, put on appropriate pers personal protective equipment. That is, uh, if you have carried out the point of care risk assessment, and you should also notify the area receiving the patient of any necessary precautions as early as possible before the patient has arrived. You should use a medical mask uh, when you are moving the patient. And then uh, above all, you should work as a team because remember it is very demanding and at times it is very stressful to be working in a, in, the, in the isolation area, limit the number of the healthcare workers that are coming in contact with the patient. And you also should maintain a record of all the people that are entering into the patient's room or ward, including the staff. And then any material that has been brought into the isolation area must stay in the isolation uh, area. Uh, the medical records, however, you should be reviewed prior to the entry you should only use them when you are outside. The medications should be measured before entering. You only move in with what you have to use. And um, the, all the waste that you have generated there should be treated as infectious and handled according to the facility pol policy. The equipment must be disinfected before removing from the isolation area. And uh, the doors must remain closed when not in use. And uh, avoid always opening the doors when it's not necessary. And for the environmental cleaning, that I would uh, touch briefly on it, but I think it's, uh, it will be covered in detail uh, tomorrow, whereby we are saying that uh, you routinely clean and disinfect the surfaces where the patient is in contact. You should clean at least twice a day and pay rising need. You should uh, use soap and water and allow to dry. And then you can then follow with uh, the disinfectant of choice or what the facility uh, has advised on. For the equipment, you use um, the, the bucket and mop uh, for your floors and for the surfaces, you have to use uh, a damp cloth. And then after patient discharge, you should perform terminal cleaning. And this will be discussed more in detail uh, tomorrow by one of my colleagues who will be covering the session the section on uh, um, environmental cleaning. And what is important is that we should avoid uh, the spraying, but uh, try by all means to wipe. And then for the discharge criteria, after the isolation, the patient should uh, remain, uh, uh, the, the duration which the patient remains isolated is determined by the clinical judgment and the country policy, and also depends on the length of the viral shading period. And it could be based on lab confirmation or clinical judgment, but the patients should remain isolated while they remain symptomatic and or during the time they are considered infectious. So in summary, we are saying that um, the isolation and cohorting are based on the modes of transmission and the isolation precautions that we briefly touched on are the contact, the droplet and the airborne precautions. And uh, we also say that uh, PPE used should be based on risk assessment. That is uh, when you put on your mask, gowns, gloves and all the other forms of PPE, you should have carried out the point of care risk assessment. And um, we also emphasize the control of ventilation, which is important, especially when we are uh, addressing droplet and airborne precautions. Uh, however, we know that we still have problems in uh, with uh, ensuring appropriate uh, airflow in Africa. And this is a very deep, a big uh, gap that needs innovative, cost-effective uh, solutions. And for the decontamination of the equipment, we are saying that um, this is a process which is followed to ensure that all reusable medical de devices are safe to use on the next patient. And um, what is required is uh, the decontamination is uh, destroys or removes the, the microorganisms before the medical device is used on another patient. It includes steps, cleaning. Cleaning is a very important step. 
uh, in the decontamination process because this is where we physically remove all uh, the organic material, including most of the microorganisms. And then we move on to the disinfection, which is the killing or destruction of most, but not all disease producing microorganisms. And we talk of sterilization, which is the destruction of all microorganisms, right? And then we, um, the level of, uh, or the method of decontamination that you are using is determined by the level of risk of uh, infection uh, transmission. For example, the devices that will be in contact with the patient's bloodstream or sterile tissue or sterile body cavities must be uh, sterilized. But those that come in contact with intact skin, like your blood pressure cuffs, they can undergo low level disinfection, which just removes most of the pathogens. And we have the Spalding classification, which gives us the guidance on how to determine the type of uh, the decontamination process that is required. And the Spalding classification cat uh, categorizes instruments into three distinct categories. That is the non-critical, the sem semi-critical, and the critical. The critical ones enter directly into the bloodstream or the sterile tissues or the cavities. And these instruments basically need a sterilization. And then the sem semi-critical ones, they come in contact with intact mucous membranes and they, they need high level disinfection. While it's the non-critical one, they touch only intact skin uh, surfaces sorry, they only uh, touch intact skin and they only need low level disinfection, which is where we remove most of the pathogens. And um, it's very important that we carry out cleaning because uh, proper cleaning removes approximately about 80 to 90% of microbial contamination. And uh, what we should, uh, the take home message is that uh, we cannot sterilize something or an instrument that has not been uh, cleaned. Because if it has not been cleaned properly, uh, the disinfectants cannot penetrate the instruments properly. And then there's another practice which we should not be doing, which is uh, soaking of instruments in a disinfectant. Um, it is a, a waste of uh, time and resources because uh, most of the disinfectants cannot penetrate organic matter. Hence, you only have to clean first. And after cleaning, you follow the manufacturer's instructions. If the instrument is supposed to be uh, 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 put in a disinfectant for five minutes, please ensure that you do that in five minutes and rinse that uh, instrument. If it remains in the disinfectant for longer, it just gets uh, damaged and it is of no uh, added benefit. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about the barriers to uh, infection prevention and control implementation. I just summarize them in the fact that uh, mostly it's uh, first and foremost, the major problem is um, the healthcare uh, worker attitudes towards infection prevention and control. Most of the times, uh, IPC is associated with hand washing, and at times it's called the nursing thing. And hence, most uh, other healthcare workers tend not to be uh, serious with uh, infection control issues unless when they are faced with an outbreak. And then at times, the healthcare workers will be uh, equipped with the required skill, with the knowledge transfer having taken place, but when they get to the clinical area and want to uh, work, they find that there is lack of supplies. For example, you want to perform hand hygiene, but you do not have alcohol-based hand drop, or you do not have the soap, or you have the soap, but there is no water. How then do you get to practice uh, proper infection control? And then um, the other barrier is the misuse of uh, PPE. And most of the times, it's because uh, uh, what is happening is uh, PPE is put on according to the degree of fear that we have. And uh, what we can do with infection control is we can uh, do some behavior change strategies because uh, after giving all the information, there is need for the healthcare worker to introspect and find out whether 
the practices that he or she has been doing endanger the life of the patient, himself or herself, and the other healthcare workers. So in terms of uh, in fact, uh, hand hygiene, these are some of the examples that I just put. We use uh, uh, the check light. This is where we, uh, during the training, we contaminate the hands of the healthcare workers with the, uh, the, the, the glow wrap, and then we ask them to perform uh, hand washing, and then uh, we view the hands under UV light just to show them which areas they would have missed in their hands. And then we say, suppose this was uh, the amount of virus that you were carrying in your hands, just uh, try and figure out how you would be spreading it from one patient to the other or from one healthcare worker to the other. We also uh, have uh, some technology that we use. Uh, this is the show wash technology, which can be used uh, for uh, uh, healthcare workers, patients and visitors. It basically teaches uh, healthcare workers, patients or visitors, the proper technique for washing hand. And in this picture here, it is um, one of uh, the infection control practitioners who was uh, demonstrating using that uh, technology, uh, how you can uh, 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 practice the hand wrap technique. And uh, down there, you can it can be converted into a phone, a phone app, which you can use offline. And it teaches you um, the technique, the proper technique for uh, performing hand hygiene. And at the end, it gives you uh, a score or the uh, like, for example, as shown in the picture there, that uh, this person took 45 seconds to hand wrap, but um, she didn't pass and she had difficulties with all the, the steps. And then we can also review patient uh, uh, case notes that is uh, the healthcare associated infection audits to make uh, to try and trace where we went wrong and how to correct those situations as part of behavior change strategies. We can also use hand hygiene awareness uh, videos like point of care videos so that we can um, uh, provoke or try and uh, uh, push the message across that we have to change behavior as healthcare workers in terms of how we disinfect our hands. And also another effective means is through the refresher trainings, like what is happening right now. We can get, we get to learn new information on a daily basis, and then you can go and uh, um, apply it in your place of uh, practice. And then at times you can use incentives that is um, um, no cost incentives in the form of certificates or badges. For uh, example, uh, in our infection uh, control program, we've, uh, we roll out the linkness pro program or hand hygiene champions that we give certificates or badges as a way of uh, ensuring behavior change. Thank you. And I will hand over back uh, to Ken and invite questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lizzie, for your in-depth um, presentation and a lot of details that you have given us, a lot of information. Uh, we're now going to have a Q&A, and with me is David Simons, who will be also be able to help me in reading the questions to Lizzie. And any other facilitator or panels uh, who will be available, they would help. So this session will go up to 12.30. Uh, then we hand over back to Mark. So to start with, I uh, think some few have sent the questions onto the chat box. But um, if there is anybody who is having, who would like his or her voice to be heard by asking questions verbally, Please just raise your hand and then um, you'll be noticed and you'll be identified and we'll give you a chance to ask the question. But to start with Lizzie, there's one question here. Uh, the question is coming from Kwaku Dua. Kwaku wants to know, do you recommend washing hands before using the washroom to avoid contaminating yourself? Well, um... What is important is what you uh, washing your hands after, right? So I would pay more particular uh, focus after using the washroom because that is when my hands would have been contaminated. 
but uh, be uh, before going into the washroom, what you would have done, the last activity that you would have carried out is what determines whether you need a hand hygiene or action at that particular time before you uh, do whatever you are doing in the washroom. So your last activity determines the, is the one that presents an opportunity for you to perform hand hygiene. Thank you, Kwan. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Kwaku, and thank you, Lizzie. Uh, the second question is coming from Claude John, Claude John Chastel, Fautu Mampangan. Uh, he's asking, when we put hands under UV light, can it pose long-term problem to us? Thank you, Klaus Jean, for uh, that question. Uh, when you are putting uh, the, your hands under UV light, it's just for training purposes, and it's only for less than uh, half a minute. So it's not something that you do on a daily basis, and your hands are not really directly under uh, like zero or one centimeter from the UV light, but they are about 20 centimeters or so from the UV light. And the exercise only takes about 30 minutes. And this we only do for training purposes just to enforce behavior change. Thank you, Klaus Jean. Thank you, thank you, Klaus Jean. Uh, the third question is coming from Bosede Arongundande. Bosede is asking about clustering method of isolation. Can clustering method be used for Lassa fever, COVID-19, and yellow fever in a single isolation ward? Okay, um, thank you, Posade, for that question. I'd like to assume that clustering is, uh, you are making in reference to cohorting, is it? I don't know. Is it co the same as cohorting? So uh, if it looks yeah. like clustering and cohorting, yeah. Yes. So if it means that you only have a single unit, like we said, you can cluster those with the lesser fever on their own, those with the COVID or on their own. So it can be done under one roof, but you make uh, the demarcations and you do not mix the patients. Thank you, Posadi, for that question. Yes, Bosede, thank you very much. Uh, the other question is coming from Marceline Sitsi Mugwenzi. Uh, would you recommend a COVID-19 red zone to have a room for removing some pieces of PPE without necessarily having to go to the doffing area and removing all PPE, e.g., that is, for example, health workers may need to change from N95 respirator to a surgical mask during their shift. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Maslin, uh, for your question. So generally in an outbreak situation, we encourage that you uh, group your activities so that when you go into the isolation area, it's only for that particular time when you are doing the care activity. So you can don your PPE, but inside there, you can uh, be removing the gloves as long as the other PPE, that is your gown and your face shield are still clean. You can move from one patient to the other, but your hands are the major problem there. Hence, we advise that you remove the gloves, perform a hand hygiene uh, action, and then don a, a set of uh, new gloves before you move on to the next patient. And you try by all means not to be inside a red zone if it is not necessary. So I would encourage you to just group your activities and make sure that maybe you just go into the red zone when it is only necessary and it won't be for more than an hour and then you can doff. And uh, if you are using an N95 respirator, you know that you can, uh, it can uh, under extended use, you can use it for a duration of uh, a maximum of five to seven days as long as it's intact. So what you do is you remove it and uh, put it in a, a, a dry envelope or khaki paper envelope and not in some way where it's moist. And then you can use the straps when you are now uh, uh, reusing it 
and you can make use of a, a paper towel or tissue paper to perform the, the seal check when you are reusing it. Thank you, Marceline. Hope you are answered. <laughs> Thank you, Marceline. Thank you, Lizzie. Uh, the other question is coming from Guy Arnold Roj Ibinda. Guy would like to know, how can one perform a good instrument? Oh, sorry, uh, Ken. I think uh, just in addition to Maslin's question, it seems uh, Global Health Network also wanted to add in something. I'm not sure. Okay. Do you want to add something? Oh, I didn't see properly on the chat box. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead. I think we'll be, be, be able to come back on to that later. Uh, there, the question is coming from Guy Arnold Roj Ibinda. Uh, you'd like to know, how can one perform a good instrument disinfection? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Guy uh, Arnold Ibinda. Uh, so basically, what you start with is... Um, there is no one size fits all situation because uh, our instruments are different. So first and foremost, you have to find out whether that particular instrument needs, uh, can withstand heat sterilization or it needs a uh, chemical uh, uh, disinfection. So from the ward, we normally say that in the ward situation, you just remove the debris by rinsing under running water, and then the instrument can then be taken to the sterile supply uh, uh, department where you have a team of trained uh, uh, healthcare workers who will then uh, take the instrument through the, the decontamination process. So depending on the facility that you are in, there are, um, in other facilities, in low middle income settings, they do manual uh, cleaning of the instruments. Then from the manual cleaning, you have to then um, dry the instrument and then inspect it for uh, uh, the integrity. And then you can use the, uh, the recommended um, facility disinfectant according to the manufacturer's uh, instructions, rinse using clean water and then dry it, and then it can be packed for sterilization. But in some uh, other uh, sterile supply departments where uh, they are seemingly uh, well up, they have automated systems that actually do the whole process that is from the cleaning, and um, you, you get to uh, just physically check, and then you can uh, pack the instrument, and then it is taken for sterilization. But first and foremost, you have to first do the risk assessment to find out which type of uh, um, uh, uh, decontamination process can the instrument stand. Can it withstand heat or it is heat sensitive? Thank you, Guy, and I hope you are answered. Thank you, Guy Ibinda. And uh, there's still a part B of his question from Guy Ibinda, is asking how long would PPE like lab coat be used in the isolation area? Um, sorry, in terms of uh, a lab coat, uh, under infection control uh, 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 practices, it is not uh, uh, classified as PPE. Because remember we said the PPE has to protect you from blood and body fluids. Right. So if there is a splash of blood, even if you are putting on that lab coat, that lab coat will be wet. And uh, with uh, the, the way in which the lab coat is made, after repeated washes, the fibers open up and it has actually a strike through uh, uh, effect. So based on the activity that you will be doing in that particular ward, you carry out the risk assessment if there is a, a risk of a splash, you can then put on a fluid resistant uh, gown or a plastic apron because that is what is going to protect you from the splashes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Guy Ibinda. Uh, there's another question from Alexandre Delamou. Uh, Alexandre would like to know, 
the limit of washing in terms of IPC regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not so sure that this makes sense to you, Lizzie. Uh, I would have wanted uh, Alexandre to actually uh, um, give a bit, shed more light. Is it hand washing or is it washing of instruments, which uh, he is yeah. making reference to? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that it can be clear. Uh, and please make the question clear. You can resend it again and make it clear for Lizzie to answer it. Uh, Lizzie, there's another one here. Uh, and this is coming from Felix Asena, and Felix is, so Felix is asking, is it appropriate to use the hand dryer to dry your hands after performing hand hygiene? Uh, thank you, Felix Asena, for that question. So for the hand dryers, there's been uh, a lot of studies that uh, actually highlight or prove that um, it is not appropriate to use it as it uh, harbors a lot of microorganisms. And once you, are, uh, you have cleaned up your hands using the, this technique that you use to dry your hands, it blows off the microorganisms back to your face and also at times back to your hands. So that's why it's not um, appropriate to use it. Okay, so Alexander. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, that one. I don't know. Uh, uh, the Alexander, Alexander has, has, has clarified this question, hand washing, he meant hand washing. Okay, so I'd like to go back to Alexandra's question. Now I can't see it on the... It looks the like chart. it has disappeared. <laughs> well, let me see if it... Um, I don't know whether it's going to answer the answered questions. Yes, it's going to answer the questions. Uh, and it's as he's asking, I would like to know the limits of the hand washing in terms of IPC regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, uh, so yes. why we are actually advocating for a more use of uh, the alcohol-based hand rub, it's because it has been proven to be very uh, effective in terms of the reduction of the bacterial log count on the hands. And if it's available at point of care, it means that within arm's reach, without you having to be uh, traveling, um, going to and fro, you just remember the sinks are not with each and every uh, bed. At times you find that the sink is only at the entrance of the ward. And if it means that you have to be walking, maybe you are at the center of the ward, and going back to the entrance of the ward to wash your hands. That is where at times uh, you get to miss the opportunities. Otherwise, we are not saying that there is anything wrong with washing your hands with uh, soap and water. But it's just for uh, the fact that uh, uh, alcohol-based hand rub has been proven to be more rapid and more effective, and it is easily uh, available at a uh, point of care unlike uh, hand washing whereby maybe at times you find that the sink is far off and you have to be moving up and down during care activities, which makes it uh, very impossible to adhere to all the uh, hand hygiene opportunities. Thank you, thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, Alexandra. There's a question here for, for Guy, and this is going to send Dr. Srinivas ready. And uh, Guy would like to know, how long most of the AMR bacteria can resist on or under the surface, like hand, coat, and instrument? Yeah, this I did come across some literature. It all depends on the pathogen. So each pathogen is different. Is gram positive, it is different. Gram negative, it is different. So it is dependent on the pathogen, I would say. I don't know exactly numbers, but it varies from few weeks to six months in case of some pathogen. So there are also in I mean, uh, some studies they have shown uh, it will last even for six months. Yeah, so this is what I can say. I don't know, I mean, on the surfaces I can say, but I don't know particularly about uh, how long it will uh, last on the coats because coats usually we don't keep it long because you should do, I mean, change it or we can, it might not be relevant. But uh, on the hands also, I mean, we wash it. So it all depends on the wash. Only we can answer on the instruments because instruments and surfaces need to be thoroughly cleaned. 
if it is not cleaned thoroughly then some uh, of them might even last for uh, six months i would say it all depends on the pathogen specifically yeah. thank you dr srinivas thank you very much uh, i'm still checking if there are some more questions uh, david simons are you there if you are seeing any other question that have not uh, touched david simon or anybody else who is seeing any other question that has not have not forwarded to Lizzie. Oh okay. yes, there's one from yes, there's one from Ishmael Conte. Ishmael is asking. I think Ishmael is in Poland. Uh, Ishmael is asking: Is it possible to resume PPE like gloves? No, sorry. Is it possible to reuse PPE like gloves and apron etc? to patients of the same infection in isolation centers. Okay, so when the question is from? Uh, Ishmael Conte. Ishmael, okay. Yes. So uh, thank you Ishmael for uh, that question. In terms of gloves, uh, you can uh, never get to reuse uh, gloves. So gloves are single use. So for each patient you have to change your uh, pair of gloves. But then when it comes to um, other forms of PPE, like uh, a heavy duty uh, plastic apron, that is uh, an equipment that can be reusable. So you can, uh, it can be uh, wiped with a, a, a damp cloth with soap and water. And then, it can, then you can use a disinfectant and also wipe it with a disinfectant before you use on the uh, next patient. But for the gloves, it's a definite no, you cannot use uh, uh, the same glove on different patients, mm -hmm. regardless of whether they have the same infections. Thank you, Ishmael. Thank you. Thank you, Ishmael, and thank you, Lizzie. Uh, we still have like three more minutes because we are going up to 12.30. Uh, three yes, more minutes. I saw a question from Guy uh, who was, uh, is asking how to get to use uh, the hand hygiene awareness videos. So um, like uh, when we use it as in forms of uh, uh, behavior change strategy, we play different scenarios. Like uh, there is one that we usually refer to as the blue movie whereby one of the healthcare workers moves from one patient care area to the other without performing proper hand hygiene and keeps on uh, picking up different microorganisms until she even leaves the hospital and gets home and even greets their child and uh, the other family members at home. Just to see the impact of you start off maybe with a simple bug like an MRSA, you pick it up and then you spread it right across the facility, you spread it on public transport right up to the time you come home. So those are the videos that we get to use. And at times we play scenarios uh, of care activities whereby uh, a healthcare worker is um, uh, delivering care and then they are presented with a hand hygiene uh, opportunity, but they get to miss it just for so that we remind each other and try and to enforce a uh, behavior change. That's how we get to use those uh, videos. Hope you are answered, Guy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the principal chair has allowed us to go up to 12.45 so we can extend. And there is hand from Anye Delphin Tango. Anya Delphin Tango, your hand is raised. Could you like to would you like to ask a question to Liz? Lizzie, please go ahead. Can you unmute, please unmute uh, Anya Delphin to ask the question? Sorry, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. Yes, no, 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 no this thing no, no, no. we find. <laughs> okay, thank fine, you. Fine. Thank, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else who is like would like her voice or his voice to be heard? This is the opportunity okay. now. There is uh, Alexandri. Yes. He says, uh, he or she says, sorry, our country dealt with the Ebola virus epidemic from 2014 to 2016. And at the outbreak of coronavirus, 
as soon as the first positive case was declared, we adopted the same IPC <clears throat> techniques. Uh, do you think we were wrong? I think if you could uh, shed more light, Alexandria, on uh, which techniques um, that uh, you are talking about. At, uh, right now, in terms of IPC, we uh, have what we call the, the COVID-19 IPC bungle, where uh, it's made up of uh, different uh, strategies. Amongst them, where there is uh, hand hygiene, there is uh, social, sorry, physical distancing in that uh, bungle. There is a uh, cough etiquette. There is uh, the universal uh, masking and uh, appropriate use of uh, personal protective equipment. I don't know if uh, those are the, the same techniques that you have uh, adopted. Uh, I think the, the other one is going, there's another question, probably this is going to all the panelists, including Dr. Kiara and Dr. Srinivas. Uh, this is coming from Wenslas, Wenslas Ladenba. He's asking, uh, Remdesivir has been recommended by the FDA in the US to treat COVID-19 during last October. Are there any reports of resistance so far? Mm. Still, first of all, the effectiveness of uh, remdesivir is still questionable. First of all, I would say it's not so significantly different from the control. Uh, I mean, it is, but not so, I mean, I wouldn't say that still it can be recommended. I think uh, <laughs> and this is what my personal opinion based on some literature that I have gone through. But uh, I'm not sure because maybe it's too early to sh say something about uh, remdesivir and its resistance because it has not been uh, used that extensively. We need more data and uh, more information to say something on this. Yeah, yeah. yeah I completely yeah. agree with Srinivas. Uh, I think with remdesivir is more a problem to prove the real efficacy and efficacy than the resistance so far. We are still a step ahead. We are not yet the, with the problem of resistance, but we are more to uh, evaluate the real efficacy of this medicine for COVID. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas and Dr. Kiara. Uh, there's another question here for Lizzie. Lizzie, uh, Isaac Mukuye is asking, can PPE guns be reused in isolation centers? Sorry, I didn't get the question again. Can guns, PPE guns, be reused in isolation centers? Guns. So the, can the PPE guns be reused in the isolation centers? Yes, yes. Now the PPE gowns are basically uh, single-use gowns which uh, should be uh, discarded. But if you need to uh, prolong, maybe uh, like uh, the term that they use is extended use, you can actually cover yourself with a plastic apron so that uh, if there is any splash, it lands on the apron, the plastic apron, and then you can be uh, changing the, uh, the plastic apron in between patients while the gown remains clean. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you. Thank you for your good answer, uh, Lizzie. Uh, the last one here, Lizzie, is uh, from Ishmael. Ishmael uh, would like to know um, what will you do to bring the sure wash technology to Africa since it is rare? Okay, thank you, Ishmael, for that question. So the show wash technology is already in use in uh, Africa. So like, uh, basically, it's just like a phone app. It can be changed into a phone app. And then from your phone, from the slide, uh, the last slide that I was showing you, that machine, you can actually um, download the app onto your phone, and then you can be practicing your hand hygiene uh, technique using your own phone. And then when it, uh, you get into, a, an in, uh, into an internet zone, you can log onto the internet and it can um, 
download all that information into a saver and collate your data and it can show you um, uh, certain percentages of how you are uh, progressing in terms of performing your hand hygiene technique. And the second part, it, it has a quiz, like a question and answer where it gives you questions and then you answer and it will be telling you whether you got the answer correct. And if you didn't get the answer correct, it gives you uh, and explains the proper answer. So it's something that can be used uh, and is already in use in Africa. So um, I don't know, maybe through the, the global health channel, if we can off the, we can uh, get the, the details, but you first have to be able to undergo some form of training so that you get to understand how it works, but it can be used anyway in Africa, can be used anyway in the world. Oh, thank thanks you. for providing yeah. that information to, to Conte, to Ishmael Conte. Thank you very much. Uh, Phoebe, Phoebe Ogutu, I believe Phoebe is from Kisumu, Kenya. Her hand is raised. Phoebe, can you go ahead and ask the question? Please unmute Phoebe so that Phoebe can ask Lizzie the question. Phoebe, are you there? Looks like Phoebe, Phoebe probably felt shy. Phoebe's hands was raised, but she felt shy. I mean, next time she'd be able to ask the, to ask the question directly. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else? Uh, any other question that probably I've, I've uh, inadvertently omitted? Any question that inadvertently omitted or any hand that is raised and I'm not seeing, this is the moment. We have, uh, I think, uh, 12 more minutes because the principal, uh, I think we can finish up. Yes, the, 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 the chair said that we can finish up if there's no more question. So I'm handing back this, I'm handing over to Max Thomason to wrap up. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Thank you very much indeed for the great uh, presentation and also answering questions. Over to you, Max. Ken, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. What a wonderful, wonderful morning we've had or, or afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. I think it's been absolutely fantastic. I'd like to say thank you so much again uh, to our fantastic presenters there. So with the introduction we had to IPC from Dr. Chiara uh, from Italy and the introduction to AMR from Dr. Srinivas, forgive my pronunciation there, uh, from Tübingen. Wonderful introductions there. And, uh, and Lizzie, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much and uh, really practical. I think it will be great. We're going to be posting all of these um, these talks as we, as we said, this is all being recorded. So this will be on the, um, on the Pandora Knowledge Sharing Hub. It will be put up probably in a couple of weeks. Um, and we're going to put the link to the Knowledge Sharing Hub in the chat so that you can all have a look. Lizzie, thanks very much for that. And um, I've, I've been checking my nails. I actually cut them last night, so I'm quite glad that I did. And uh, thank you so much. And I think we'd all, you know, wh wherever we are, we'd really want to be putting our hands together to say thank you for those really wonderful, informative presentations. And thank you too to our colleagues for some excellent sharing there from John in Zambia and from Ken there in, in, in Kenya. A really fantastic morning. So um, we are going to um, be able to close a little bit earlier. We wanted to allow enough time for the Q&A. Thank you everybody for your questions. And if you've still got some questions, you can still post those. Uh, you can post those tomorrow if you wish. So tomorrow we've got another action packed day or morning or afternoon. Uh, we've got um, three separate topics, three sessions and we've got four very 
interesting speakers for you tomorrow and we look forward to having plenty of discussion. Um, don't forget that uh, in order to get the uh, certificate for attendance, you do need to attend at least 80% of the course and we will also be posting out the evaluation form. And we will be following up after the course with an email to everybody with the link to the evaluation form and also with some other very useful links. So, for example, some future learn courses. Uh, and we'll also be sending you some links for within Pandora, uh, the main network that's hosting this workshop. We have a, a, an AMR resistance survey. Uh, just to give us some more insight into how we're tackling AMR and antimicrobial stewardship. And there are three different surveys. One is for clinical institutions, one is more for veterinary, and one is for our colleagues who are in ministries of health, so for example, agriculture. Each of those surveys takes about 15 minutes, so we'll include those in our email just to give you the heads up, so that if you or you want to forward those to any colleagues, uh, we can get get a really good breadth of information there, we can analyse that and then we can um, make sure everybody knows what results come out of that survey. So I think that's something that we can all get involved in and, and we can share the links to that. So thank you very much everyone for um, a really great workshop. We look forward to seeing you all at the same time tomorrow. So that's 0900 hours uh, GMT. Thanks very much, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Bye now.